We are recording. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. It is October 21st, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and live stream. There are in fact eight counselors in the room tonight and there are four people in the audience. Um, and at this point, point, only one person on Zoom. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the October 21st regular town council meeting to order at 631. I will call upon each counselor by the name they have indicated they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. Please remember to mute your mic again. Pat DeAngelis. Present. I'm sorry. Present. Thank, Thank you. you. Anna Devlin Gotham. Present. Whoa. Okay. Sorry, my microphone is very loud. <laughs> Councillor Ette is not here yet. Okay. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Uh, Pam, you need to put your mic up a little more or lean closer. Thank you. Here. Here. Is that better? That's a lot better. Thank you so much. Um, Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. And Councilor Walker. Here. Thank you. Uh, there's no chat room for this meeting. If there's technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And uh, we will decide what to do with that at the time. Uh, there is no serious change to the agenda order. The discussion regarding the town manager's goals will follow the action items. And during the meeting, there will be one general comment period and one special public comment period related to the Amherst Black Reparations Committee charge. Uh, Councillor Ette, would you just press the mic and say present? Present. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, under announcements, I just wanted to call your attention to the, de to the fact that we are officially beginning the town manager evaluation period. Uh, this is a process during which we collect feedback uh, from chairs, boards, and board chairs of boards, chairs and members of boards and committees and commissions, our staff and the public. All responses are due by midnight, October 31st, and at that point, all counselors will receive the responses and have an opportunity to do their own evaluation. We have two meetings scheduled in November for the council. One is November 4th. It will start at 6 o'clock p.m. with the financial indicators presented to the budget coordinating group. It is also a regular town council meeting, but will include representatives from the library, board of trustees, and also the school committee. Uh, on November 18th, we will have a reading period starting at 5 for the town manager evaluation and a public forum on the FY26 budget. Uh, at 6.30. Uh, there are committee meetings scheduled as well uh, that are on the calendar. Uh, I want to call attention to the fact that there is a district meeting for District 5 scheduled tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. It is virtual, and the link for this can be found on the community calendar on the town's website. There's no hearing uh, tonight, and so we'll move to general public comment. Any, anybody wishing to speak who is in the town room, if you have not signed up, please do so with Athena. If you are on Zoom and you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Okay. Uh, let's... <laughs> 
the people are still coming in, so I'm going to wait just a moment on the um, Zoom. Again, if there's anybody on Zoom who would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Okay, then let's begin with the uh, those people in the room. Athena, please. Vince O'Connor. Let me let me just. I'm sorry. There's a few other things I'd like to say. Public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to two or three minutes. In this case, we'll go with three minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on matters raised during general public comment. Public comment uh, comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. Uh, I also want to call attention to the fact that there will be a three-minute period with clock on the uh, Zoom as well. Uh, the First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak, and to express themselves, including their rights to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those comments down under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of eminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in inappropriate speech, I must defer to the practice of freedom of speech. So we will start with those people in the room and then move to Zoom and then back to the second person in the room. Thank you. Vince O'Connor. Do we have a clock? Thank you. Yeah, uh, can you... Um... Enlarge the clock so that I can see it. If you're going to hold me to the three minute limit, I would like to be able to see the clock. Do you, do you see it here where my cursor is? Say again. Do you see the clock where my cursor is right here? Yeah, that's a. It'll turn yellow when you're getting um, close to your time. Is it possible to to alter the there. location? Is that and, better? And enlarge the clock so that it's actually visible to me. Is that better? Um, here? Yes. M okay. Much better. Yes. Go ahead. Please state your name and where you yeah. are. Vincent O'Connor, uh, 175 Summer Street, Apartment 12. Um, so I was surprised, um, but not that much, when I read in the paper that the project at 4555 South Pleasant Street had been altered to become a dormitory of Amherst College. I listened to the video of the Wednesday night, October 16th meeting of the Amherst Planning Board. Site plan review is uh, conducted under the provisions of the zoning bylaw, uh, section 11.2. And it, it has very specific requirements and as you can see from the paper in front of you, the counselors who were here. Um, during the video, contrary to the statements of the bylaw directly, um, the chair of the bylaw, Mr. Marshall, uh, initially said how difficult it was to, um, to turn down a site plan review and then twice at the at point between 145 and 150, um, a minute 45 and a minute 50 of the video, he made a declaration that it was statutorily impossible to turn down a site plan review. That statement is not correct. It should not have been made by the chair of the planning board. And as far as I'm concerned, this body, which has let, which has an oversight function as well as a, a function about um, finance and laws, ought to call Mr. Marshall before the, the appropriate committee of this council and ask him why he made a statement that directly contradicts the, the Amherst zoning bylaw. Um, and I will refer you to the end of the thing. Mr. 
it says, um, the board's written decision shall consist of either approval, 11.2501, denial of the site plan based on, and so forth. Absolutely contradicting Mr. Marshall's um, statement. And so what I would say is that he needs to be held to account as the chair of the planning board for making a statement that is definitively false and misleading both to the public and to his fellow board members. Thank you for your comments. Jeremy Anderson, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Jeremy Anderson, 34 High Point Drive in Amherst. I just wanted to thank the town council for bringing forward the motion tonight to create school zones for the high school and the middle school. This is a wonderful action that will keep our kids safe. It promotes traffic calming throughout our town, and it sends a great message to our families that we are encouraging our students to walk, to bike, and to roll to school each day. Thank you all for your time and your efforts. Thank you for joining us, Jeremy. Athena. Jen. Thank you. Please come up and make your comment. And please state your name and where you live before you make your comment. Uh, I am Jin Jen Pathampong, 1040 North Pleasant Street, apartment 355. And my question is whether, whether there is a way in which we can still have a balance between uh, college student housing and the housing needs for other residents in Amherst in order for us to still remain as this, you know, quote unquote, leader of affordable housing. Like in 2021, we had a comprehensive housing plan that was unanimously voted by all the counselors here, yet the yet it was left out that we that the lot sizes were not mentioned leading us to have a massive sprawl and in extremely high house housing prices when i lived here last year i experienced an a sudden spike in rents like i don't know how many percent i could calculate it it just like exceeded $2000 a month when i was living here one time so my question is, is there a way we could adhere to the 2021 comprehensive housing plan while still balancing the needs of other residents who need affordable rental housing? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. And let me note that one item was inadvertently left off. And unless there's any objection, I'm going to add it in. And if you object, you can add, ask that it be taken off. It's the proclamation. Uh, these items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item, to remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I've listed all of the consent agenda items. That does not require a second. The motion is to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, proclamation recognizing the 2024 Asian Festival of Lights. Next item, waiver of town council rules of procedure rule 8.6 for agenda item nine, a1 and 9A2, that's wrong here. Um, town manager appointments to elementary school building committee and community preservation act committee. 8D, authorization of town council president to sign a letter on behalf of the town council in support of equitable approaches to public safety. Please note that I'm more than willing to accept additional changes to that 
as we before we send it off. 9A, one to four, approval of town manager appointments, cultural council, Evan Figueroa and William Murray for terms to expire June 30th, 2027. Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, Erica Piedad for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. And Angelique Ferguson for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. Elementary School Building Committee, Dr. Zamora Zim uh, Herman, AHARPS, Amherst Regional Public Schools, Superintendent of Schools, for a term to expire at the completion of the project, Community Preservation Act Committee, Planning Board Representative Lawrence Klitz, for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. Mandy Jo Hannock, uh, excuse me, Councillor Hannock. I'm not pulling anything off. Um, and it's just so you know, um, I want to clarify, you said eight, nine, a one and two, but I believe those Oops. are three and four on the agenda. But I also want to clarify that on the motion sheet itself, they're listed as a, B, C, D. So Athena on the motion sheet, you might want to change them to one, two, three, four. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Thank you. We'll move immediately to a vote. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothian. Aye. Councilor Rette. Aye. Lynn Griesmerson. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask Anna Devlin Gothier, Vice President of the Council, to read the last paragraph or two of the resolution. Thank you. I mean, of the proclamation. Absolutely. And this is the Town of Amherst proclamation recognizing the 2024 Asian Festival of Lights. Council sponsors were myself, Councillor Ette, and Councillor Griesmer. Community sponsors were Shalini Ball and the Pioneer Valley Indian Association, and the town sponsors were the Town of Amherst Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department, the Human Rights Commission, and the Amherst Recreation Department. So, last, just the last two. I highly encourage everyone to read the whole thing. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, recognize the religious, historical, and cultural significance of Diwali, the Festival of, Festival of Lights, and its message of tolerance, compassion, and the victory of good over evil, which re resonates with the American spirit. And be it further proclaimed, we, the Amherst Town Council, express our deepest respect and best wishes for South Asians and all Americans in our community who celebrate the Festival of Diwali on November 1st, and extend the invitation from the Pioneer Valley Indian Association to join a celebration on November 10th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. for cultural performances and dinner at Wesley United Methodist Church, 98 North Maple Street in Hadley. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to the um, presentation and discussion items. Tonight, uh, we have the opportunity to have the Human Rights Commission um, here to make a brief presentation about their report, which is in your packet, and an opportunity to answer questions. I know we have two members, well, we have a member of the committee and the staff in the room if you'd like to come forward. And in the audience, we have uh, Ronnie Parker. And I believe if you would bring Ronnie in, that would be good. Ronnie is one of the co-chairs. Thank you. Welcome, Ronnie. Hi. Wow. I think this is the first time I've been able to be seen um, at a town council meeting. And it really does feel different. It does make you visible and important human right on this for this discussion. Thank you for that. Um, could I check to see if Liz Haygood is in this group? And she's the co-chair. If she's not, I'll just go forward. 
we do not see her either in the room or on Zoom. Okay, okay great. So I'm uh, sorry. You've seen the human so hold on, hold on. She's coming in the door. So if you would just give us a moment. <laughs> Liz, come on up. <laughs> Welcome. So, um, Liz, we have Ronnie Parker on Zoom, and we've introduced the fact that we're going to talk about the Human Rights Commission report. And so for you and Ronnie as co-chairs, and also Deborah is one of your members, please go ahead. Um, Liz, were you ready to start or do you want me to? I would appreciate it if you started. And I can okay. Picking my brain. Okay. So you all have the report, and in the scheme of things, it's fairly short. It's just three pages. Um, we provide an introduction which is a little bit deeper than what we usually go into, particularly with regard to what human rights are. And this is because it's reflective of other discussions we've had in our commission meetings this past year to increase understanding of it for ourselves and establish a foundation for what do we mean by human rights when we talk about it in Amherst. Um, then there's a section on um, what we did this year. Uh, there are two parts to it. One big part is the uh, complaints section, which I'll go to next. But we did have lots of events as we've had every year in the past. I'm going to let Liz talk about that a little bit later. But a big accomplishment this year that we did on top of that is to finalize our bylaws. And this is something that had been started before I joined the Human Rights Commission. Uh, it just took a long time. There was a lot of debate discussion. And this year we sat down with the town manager and also the town's legal counsel. And we believe have gotten it to a point where it is certainly ready, was ready months ago for a town council vote and we urge you to vote and support that um, so we can have that formal backing. Um, regarding the um, complaints, we had 10 um, this year. The important thing to note about this is that it is not, we do not have much to do with the complaints. The complaints go to the DEI office and they manage it so that confidentiality can be maintained. And we have found this to be very difficult in terms of acting as a commission. So, but on the other hand, we do understand the confidentiality aspects and we have some ideas about how to deal with this um, going forward next year. And I'll ask Deb Kolodny to talk some more about that uh, as soon as I go over this whole thing. Um, yeah, and I just, so we also have a proposal for the next three years so we can do something more than have events. We feel that this is really, when we think about what we do and people ask me, what do you all do in the commission? It seems like we don't do anything because we have no interaction on the uh, complaints process and uh, the events are all pretty much run by the DEI office and really should be run by them or a cultural office of some sort. Um, I couldn't tell you what our budget is, if you ask me, and I have no idea. You know, I mean, not that we should. We're not an operational entity. So what I'm trying to say is that it's been very challenging to figure out what do we do and how do we impact on human rights in Amherst? so that they're respected and so that violators are called to account. And so that's what puts us into the way forward, which I want to ask um, uh, Deb to speak about. But maybe first, um, Liz, did you want to say more about the events? No, one of the major things- Please, that please lead in and mic. make sure oh, the sorry. mic is green. It's green. Thank you. Oh, that sounds better. Um, one of the things that we're looking forward to this year is instead of having so many mini cultural events, we wanna do one major one. 
and then um, some smaller ones based on need. For instance, I'm fully aware and I will fight to the tooth for Kwanzaa and Martin Luther King based on the history of African-Americans in this country. And so, but we want everybody to share in the experience of other cultures. So that's one of the things that is one of our proposals. One of the things you also might need to know is that on November 17th is going to be our retreat where we are going to be putting a stab at, taking a stab at um, things for the next year and possibly beyond the next year. So given that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to my esteemed colleague. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Hi, I'm Rabbi Deb Kolodny. I am a member of the Human Rights Commission. And um, thanks, Ronnie, for your overall report. Um, I'm just going to be speaking a little bit about the way forward. Um, the commission has designed a three-year plan so that we do more than just receive complaints, or the DEI office does more than receive complaints. Um, and we thought it was critical to do some education in the community around what human rights are, what they mean. And there's this wonderful model that we have when you join a commission or a committee where you have to take this incredibly boring video on what a conflict of interest is, and then you take a quiz. But boring aside, we thought, well, there's a technology that we use already that the community is accustomed to. We could create a video that describes what human rights law is, what human rights violations are, what a culture that honors human rights diversity or human rights and diversity would look like. Um, that has a self-test at the end of it. And so in our first year of our upcoming plan, our intention is to write a script, produce that video, and then ensure that um, all municipal employees and school district employees watch it, all members of committees watch it. Um, and then if we can invite or really urge all business members, business owners um, also to watch it. Um, gosh, if there was a way to make it a condition of licensing or ongoing licensing, that would be amazing, um, right? But I don't know if that's possible. So that's year one of the plan. And then year two, launch a data collection process, which is not about asking people to submit complaints to get resolved, but just asking people, what's your experience in the community? We could even have both sides of the coin. We could ask people where, what businesses are just doing an amazing job at being respectful of diversity and welcoming and inclusive and um, honoring uh, and inviting um, participation and what municipal entities are and what school districts are. And where are you having a rub? Where are you having a challenge? To the extent that the town would be responsible for things like, I think there was a case where um, there wasn't an accessibility ramp outside a public building. And so that got addressed. It could bring to our awareness things that need to happen um, that aren't coming to our awareness because actually calling up a municipal entity and saying this is an issue um, might be a heavier lift for some, especially those who don't feel included and aren't don't feel aren't people of privilege to like take that step. But you know if you've got an ongoing survey that's just on the website and anybody can log into it at any time, it's more accessible or it should be more accessible. And finally, accountability. Once we've gathered some data and we have a sense of what's going on and maybe get feedback from the video about the education, um, we will then have to explore what kinds of, of accountability are appropriate. We're not a legal entity that's going to you know, resolve disputes. So I'm not talking about anything punitive like or like that, but it might be that follow-up education might be necessary. Um, there, there might, or it might be that you know accessibility needs need to be met. That's to be determined based on what kind of information comes to us. So that's the plan. It would be um, some funding would be required for the production of the video in year one. But the good news about surveys is are that you know Google survey free, so <laughs> that wouldn't be a heavy lift. All right, sorry, I took a lot of our time. So. So then I want to close by saying that, you know, this is a really special opportunity for us to present our report and not just hand over a piece of paper to the town council, because I think we think that you all have 
a very crucial role to play in making this happen, sort of at the higher level like we do. And um, so far, one thing we've noticed this year is that we've had no interaction with the town council. You've had no questions or consultations with us. We asked for a representative and nobody has the time for us, all of which I understand everybody's busy. Um, but I do want to point out that we're very keen to have um, a closer relationship because we think that um, in order for human rights to really be important in this town, we need that policy level connection or lens or advice ourselves, whereas we in turn can advise you. I wanted finally to thank the town manager for helping us to fill all our seats. We have only one vacancy and we're really privileged to have an amazing group of commissioners now. The, the range of expertise is really quite impressive. And I think if any of you chose to work with us, you would benefit a lot just from those interactions. So with that, I'm finished. Liz, did you want to have any final words? I do not have any final words. I also want to thank Ronnie for taking such a critical leadership role and Deb for putting this report together. Um, I also want to say that we all, as different people, don't always agree on everything, but we always have a common goal, and that's about human rights. So it doesn't matter what our own personal biases are. We often put aside some things. We challenge each other respectfully, and we move forward that would benefit everybody in our town. Okay. Thank you all for being here. And I just want to recognize that uh, there are three other members of the committee. Uh, I did check the audience, and at this point, I don't see any of the other ones there. Uh, so I'm going to move to questions from the council. Uh, Councillor Haneke. It's not really a question for you all. I, it's more of a thank you to you all, <laughs> um, but a question. Um, thank you for the report. I was surprised to see in there that you had been working on the general bylaw that governs the Human Rights Commission um, and that you had expected town council action because mm -hmm. I haven't, as a counselor, seen that review and all and that you seem to be thinking it was in front of us. So that's not your fault. And that's why the question is not to you. The question is now to Paul and Lynn and those that sit in agenda setting. If the commission has, has a draft that they want us to review and adopt and they thought that we were there months ago, why have we not seen it for referral to presumably GOL yet? No, we do have a draft from the Human Rights Commission. It's gone back and forth with the town attorney okay. of the DEI department. I think you. I think the HRC is finished with it. They've said we've. We, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, I need to put together the memo that puts together the uh, town attorney's opinion and the Human Rights Commission's um, recommendation to bring to you. So that's in my court. When do you think we'll see it? By pre, hopefully the end of this month. You know, okay. It's 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 all put together. Okay. Thank you, and Mandy Joe, That was my question too, because it's first I realized we were supposed to be re reviewing this. But I suspected, as the town manager has just confirmed, that it's going back and forth with legal review, which is just as good that it does that beforehand. Are there other questions? Um, let me just observe a couple things. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, please. Just a quick question, and thank you, all three of you, for the report and for uh, all your service on the Human Rights Commission into the town. I just had a question with, um, all the complaints that were referred, often it's referred out to state commissions. Do you, does the Human Rights Commission, when those issues or complaints are acted upon by the state commissions, do you hear back? I mean, do you get a record of how those, what the disposition We get is? a DEI report every meeting. So sometimes it could be a month before we receive one, but we do get updates from the DEI office every time we meet. Are those public? Is, is that? But no. Our meetings? Just the dispositions on the complaints. No, we don't always know the final conclusion. In fact, we've been going back and forth about what should go in a public report like this uh, because of the various confidentialities. But one of the things I really wanted to see is what was the con conclusion. 
And I would like to see less recourse to law and more of the, uh, there, there is the, um, the right to a conference. Uh, so more of an opportunity to have informal uh, conflict resolution. But I think it's, you know, I'm being told that it's more comp it's complicated to bring people together. And again, because we don't know what it is and who the parties are, and, you know, we know so little about it. It's one of the parts of the report that makes me very uncomfortable, actually, as being part of the human rights report. But I think what we were trying to do looking forward is really uh, to own up to what we're doing. So it's, in, it's what we are ourselves doing and can take responsibility for and can direct in the future. One of the things that makes and, it more difficult. Oh, I'm sorry, Ronnie, are you, do, you, do you want to finish? A, fi a final thing is that people, residents have asked me, well, what happens when there are repeat offenders? Well, we don't have a system for tracking that per se, but the numbers are so small, the DEI office probably knows off the top of their head, but we don't know. So these are things that need that we need more data on. And I think that the work that we're proposing in the future will give us sufficient information that we can tackle some of these difficult questions. One of the things that makes it a little more difficult, and this is one of the things we went back and forth with with the, um, our legal counsel when we looked at our bylaws, was on the issue of confidentiality. And the more people that know, the more likely it is for somebody to um, be put in a difficult position based on somebody leaking. And I don't, that's not a good word, but mm -hmm. leaking out information mm -hmm. that shouldn't get leaked out. So that's part of the struggle that we have. One of the things that we are very much wanting to have is at least a tally of if there was three complaints from about, I'm not picking on anybody, so leave me alone. <laughs> so three complaints about housing. So, okay, there's this complaint about Lynn's housing and then another complaint about Lynn's housing and a third complaint about Lynn's housing. Now, we what do we do about that? And who do we... Um, push that forward to? Who do we factor in? What, what are the factors? How can we be of help? And sometimes we don't have that information based on the confidentiality. So that's a struggle for all of us as commissioners when it comes up. I just want to say that um, all of us totally trust the DEI office and how it um, and its dispositions or the way it assists mm -hmm. people who make complaints. Yeah. <clears throat> I think as an attorney who's done policy work, that there's just, um, there's a bit of a misfit. People think the Human Rights Commission is responsible for this, and we're not. Mm -hmm. We just get very, um, well, we get, <laughs> I was gonna say redacted reports. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. there's a gap between expectation and assumption and reality. And so I'm not sure fixing the confidentiality problem is the issue. I think fixing the, expectation and assumption is the problem is maybe the way to go. Okay. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I uh, totally appreciate the work that's been done. It's, yeah, it's, it's always very interesting to see the report and to understand what goes on in the background because your public face is, is these wonderful events that are typically outdoors, that are community building and those have been so popular. I, but I understand that so much of your energy goes into or organizing and managing those that you feel like you maybe aren't getting to the heart of the real work that you're supposed to do. So your decision to back off on the number of events makes a lot of sense, but I, my hat's off to you for the work that you do. Thank you. Councilor Ette. Um. Um, thank you again for your work. And piggyback back off what was said in the last comment, I was wondering if you have any general criteria on the kind of events that the HRC would consider co-sponsoring in the future, because that may be more important than a figure like two or three. If you know what the criteria is, that could determine the events that you're interested in. I want to jump in and say that we're extraordinarily expansive about co-sponsoring. 
if an organization mm -hmm. in town is going to hold an event that's uh, uplifting um, the culture or experience of our variety of, you know, residents, we're right there. I don't even know, as long as it's positive and it promotes human rights, right, you know. So um, I can't even imagine here in the Happy Valley something else happening. The real issue was um, how how many events the DEI office and the commission would sponsor and do the lifting for. Right. Because we were finding that, you know, we would have like, I don't know, 15 events a year and some had three people and some had 500 people and there was no intermingling and no learning from another. So you're basically speaking to the choir like the Latino event, you know, Latinos came to. And we were hoping to bring together people together to learn and to rejoice together. So, um, but it looks like Ronnie, you were gonna say something? You wanna jump in? Um, I think you've covered it. We did, I did wanna emphasize that we did speak in a fairly organized way about partnerships and doing more with other organizations and um, Deb's point about the cross-cultural aspects and the benefits of that. Oh, and I want to echo, sorry, what Liz said earlier about Kwanzaa, and um, there's several. Uh, uh, yeah. Mostly yeah. Men, um, I mean, the Frederick Douglass speech. Yeah. Come on, Please speak know. to the mic. Yes. <laughs> so we was talking about um, MLK, Kwanzaa, Black History Month, and it doesn't have to be a huge thing. Like when we do the flag raising for Black History Month, we have always been a part of that. Right. Could be something as small as that or something as large as when we're down at Mill River and we co-sponsor with the basketball program and our Youth Hero Awards. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things that we don't want to lose, but we also, um, as a smaller commission of the town, are very taxed for doing a lot of larger things. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to piggyback on other things like the Frederick Douglass reading and Juneteenth and things like that. The other thing that I think is important for you all to know that I'm sure that we all forgot until just now is that some of us also um, attend um, other town meetings like CSSJC mm -hmm. and affordable housing and we update each other on what's going on and how can we help those other entities be as productive as they want as they can be with the town and support them in their missions as well. Okay, um, Pat. Thank you. Um, one of the things I had the privilege of working on one of the first years in council um, was the development of a wage theft bylaw. And it is supposed to be um, uh, monitored by the human rights uh, director and the human rights commission. Oh. And I'm wondering, and one of the proposals in it is that there would be education for uh, businesses, et cetera, about wage theft and whether any of that has happened. And also there are reports that we have not gotten uh, because it doesn't seem to me that the commission has known about this. Oh, no shame or blame uh, at this commission yeah. works incredibly hard. Um, Yes. But I'm very interested in what's going on around the wage theft, if anything. I think that I think that what's not clear is that we're there's a human rights director who is also the DEI director, and then there's us. And I don't think any of us have heard of this before, but this is part of it. That a lot of the work. I mean, to be honest, you know, we get credit for all these events, but we just show up. I mean, sometimes some of us volunteer. But the DEI office, two people carry that whole burden. They do a ton of work that's connected to human rights in addition to other aspects of DEI. Um, so I, of course I wanna say we don't know about it, but more than that, I want to say that it took me several months before I found out who was the director of human rights and that there was a director of human rights, but actually the DI office does all the work and they probably know about this and know what's been happening. Thank you. And this was not a criticism of the commission, That's but it fine. is. Please speak to the mic, Pat. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were done, Ronnie. I um, am done. It seems to me that that's something I need to talk to the town manager about, about this bylaw because it's not clear that it's ever been implemented. 
so directly. as Ronnie has said, and this not was, just this section of it. So no, there's so obviously some things that we could work on and do better. And I think that with Deb's um, proposal that we've been trying to flush out for the last five or six months, um, that some of that would come up. The other thing that um, I want to just tweak in a different way for Ronnie's assertions that the DEI office does, because we do a lot of legwork when necessary, um, when it comes to these events. And I know for me personally, um, with Jennifer from last year, you know, I was behind the scenes with Kwanzaa. I'm behind the scenes with, I write all the speeches and things that we have to do. I flush out all the um, applications for the Youth Hero Awards and condense it into a smaller statement so that you get the gist of who we're presenting as a, a youth hero. And um, Ronnie does a lot of lifting. Deb, we had the um, Southeast Asian event at Crocker Farm. We co-sponsored that, so they took the lead on it, but we met with them and talked about them and fleshed out some things. And so, yes, and, and we also, um, some of us were on the Crest Director's um, Search. Search. Um, hiring Search. committee. I know that I was on the chief of police hiring committee. So there's been a lot of things happening behind the scenes. So I don't want to say that Ronnie's not correct, that the DEI takes the lead, but we also sometimes way behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the scenes do a lot of work to support all the work that the DEI does. And sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Just off yeah. Are there other comments from counselors? Uh, let me just say that I've, I've really enjoyed you, the events you've done, and it's clear that a ton of work on behalf of your part and our staff have gone into those events, along with maybe co sponsors that have been doing them. Um, and it's, I they have brought together people across the community that identify in certain different ways. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how you come up with a solution that still attracts that uh, cross um, group of people in our community that don't otherwise engage. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people would come to those events that we never see any place else. And that's uh, something that I think has been valued but I also just have to say, having gone to several of them, the amount of work that goes into them, the amount of effort to get donated food and to set up and to have people's speeches written and everything else, um, the awards are just astounding. So I'm not at all surprised that you wanna step back and say, what can we do reasonably and do it well? So and you won't have to wait long Mark your calendars, April 5th, mega event. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. Okay, are there other questions from the council? Thank you all for joining us. So thank you for having us and thank you for listening and understanding what we do for the town and to support you all and your missions as well when it comes to bringing our community together. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank yep. you. Okay, we are going to move on to our action items. Um, the first action item is regarding the University of Massachusetts request to place campus vehicular directional signs in the public way. Uh, this was reviewed by the Town Services and Outreach Committee. So I'm gonna call upon Andy and then we're going to move to a motion. Well, I'm not gonna speak at any length at all because uh, we provided a written report and uh, there was some additional information that we requested that was uh, provided and uh, is made, I noted through the report where you can find that addition, those additional items that the university provided in answers to some of our questions. Um, we did our best to um, 
take account of questions that were asked last time. This was before the council and to present those questions and make sure that we not only received an answer, but included the answers in the reports. So the ones that uh, we recognized as being uh, need, uh, needing that kind of uh, response. And I hope that all of your questions were answered. If uh, not, um, then please uh, uh, ask and uh, hire another member of the committee will do our best to to further respond uh, but hopefully um, the report uh, is inclusive enough that it covers um, all of the questions were asked ultimately I think the, the one thing that we noted at the end is that you know there was a question of uh, the number of signs most of them are going on the university property um, and we gave deference to the uh, university uh, just because they are the ones who feel that the need for the signs that is their project. Um, but and we didn't think that it in any way interfered or affected us public way. And is actually, as uh, we recognize that the town has done a good job of trying to have directional signs so that people aren't wandering about burning up extra gasoline, providing extra pollution. And uh, we appreciate the university thinking in the same way. While I read the motion, please bring Guilford Mooring in, our superintendent of Department of Public Works. Uh, so the motion is to approve the installation of seven, in parentheses, seven vehicular directional signs in the public way as directed in the memo from Paul Bockham and town manager dated September 19th, 2024, in quotes, use of the public way, University of Massachusetts Amherst directional signs, in quotes, on page 11 to 10 to 11 of this motion sheet and authorize the town engineer to make adjustments in the field during the install installation process as necessary. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Haneke. So we don't have a time limit on this and I'm not gonna propose a motion for a time limit because I believe when we did the original non on the common Amherst College signs, we did not have a time limit in that motion either. Mm -hmm. But my question is, do we ever as a town come back and review these allowances for whether we they're still necessary, whether we want to uh, continue letting them use the public way or are we never gonna see this as a governmental legislative body that approves public way requests again? What What's the process for? Is this basically, if we approve this, it's in perpetuity or is there in town a regular review process and timeline for review of these things? Town manager, please. So there is no review of um, permissions provided to the by the council uh, for sign signage. Occasionally, you'll see a sign that's not lo no longer needed, and the you know DPW can go out and make that make the adjustment. Um, but there, we most of the signs are in public ways. Tend to be town signs that we are in control of. They're either directional, they're uh, traffic control signs, or something like that. You could put a time limit on it. Uh, I, you could. Probably in the future, if the council chose to rescind the permission, you could probably rescind that permission. Um, I don't know legally um, if someone invests a lot of money in a sign, if you could go out next week and sort of rescind that or not. Guilford, do you have any thoughts on that? Guilford. We, we've never actually put a time limit on it. Okay, uh, um, but as the town manager said, if we decide we'd like a sign removed, somebody could come in and request that. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilor Ryan. It's uh, dangerous to rely on my memory, but my memory tells me that we did actually put a time limit on the college, Amherst College request for a sign 
Uh, or did just we not? the one on the common. I'm sorry? Just the one on the common. Right. They had like seven other requests. So your question is about any sign anywhere time limit as opposed to on the common. Okay. Are there any additional questions or comments? George, you have your hand up. Okay. Okay, then we'll move to a vote. Uh, and I'll start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous. Uh, the next item is a proposed establishment of a school safety zone at Amherst Regional Middle School and Amherst Regional High School. Rather than read the motion, I'm going to ask Anna Devlin Gothier and Kathy Shane, who were the primary authors of this, if they would like to um, comment at this time. Sure. Where's Kathy? Kathy's right ahead of me. Um, Kathy, do you want me to go first or do you have anything? Okay. So this was brought to um, our attention from some members of the public who were saying, why don't we have school zones at some of our schools? And part of the reason was that up until relatively recently, as we said in our memo, uh, the Massachusetts amendments to the manual on uniform traffic control devices uh, had specified that school zones were only at schools serving first through eighth grades or grades within that span. Uh, the last time the council, Andy informed us, the last time the council has approved a school zone was in 2017. Since that point, the MUTCD has been, that acronym should feel shorter to say than the whole title, but somehow it doesn't, uh, has been updated and has allowed for establishment of school zones at schools serving anywhere between kindergarten and 12th grade if they're approved by, um, it's it's not any any establishment that claims to teach, never mind, I'm stuck going down that rabbit hole. So what we're doing here is uh, requesting that we place um, school zone signs at the middle school and the high school. And these signs are extremely narrowly dictated by the Department of Transportation. They specify, um, I wrote it down, they specify the look of the sign, they specify the verbiage, they specify the color, they specify the limit of speed, it has to be 20 miles an hour. They provide guidance on location, uh, meaning it specifies that it should be between 200 and 500 feet from the school grounds. And it uh, they specify whether it flashes, uh, sorry, we get to decide whether it flashes or not. Uh, the sponsors of this wanted it to flash, but it specifies when it will be uh, permitted to flash. And it specifies that it be, um, that you, if you choose for it to flash, uh, that the language that you use for when it is to be flashing. The sponsors wrote this memo for council approval and um, specifically because there is so much already specified in the manual uh, on uniform traffic control devices that there is very little left up for decision. We did not believe that this should get bogged down in a committee approval process because there's very little for that committee to discuss other than the hours that children arrive at school and the 300 feet foot span that these signs should be placed according to the uh, traffic control. DPW are the ones who have the best guidance on where to place these signs. For us to send this to a committee to confer with another committee to come back to recommend would add weeks and weeks and weeks to this process when we know that DPW is the group that should be able to say this is where the sign goes and place it. it should be consistent with the way we've placed other signs which DPW has done. So we are hopeful that the council will approve this uh, motion which is specifying that the time we set be reviewed at, by committee after a year uh, and that the DPW be the uh, body which determines where these signs should go within the guidance of the um, Massachusetts amendments to the manual on uniform traffic control devices. Kathy, do you have anything to add? I, just just briefly, um, we met in an informal way over Zoom 
with the safe routes to school person based in the schools and uh, and a leader in tech and one other advocate who has been worried about this for a while to most of the discussion was um, if they're flashing, which hours of the day should they flash and when, how early in the morning, when should that end? And we thought that would involve a discussion in the school and the school should be involved in it. So I just wanted to add to what Anna said that we, uh, you may remember, you may not, but in the capital improvement plan, we voted for uh, the technology to put um, speed signs or signs signage in. So I don't know whether some of that money could be used for this, but the idea of the flashing when it's when school early hours, late hours uh, was brought to us as definitely needed because right now some of the time uh, doesn't cover the after school time or people coming in early in the morning. So really slowing down. So uh, as Anna said, we thought this could be expedited because some of the decisions are gonna be made with the schools on placement and times of day that it should be flashing if we'd go the flashing route. And Lynn, you did not make a motion and I'd like to, um, so that we are discussing the motion if that's okay. Um, I'd actually like to hear from a couple people. I don't think I, there's no motion on the table for us to be discussing. So shouldn't we make the motion? Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I move to establish designated school zones in accordance with the Massachusetts amendments to the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices at the Amherst Regional Middle School and Amherst Regional High School with flashing indicator lights to be placed at the discretion of the Superintendent of Public Works and to be illuminated between the hours of 6.30 a.m. and 10 o'clock a.m. and between the hours of 3 o'clock p.m. and 6 o'clock p.m. with a review of this timing by the Town Services and Outreach Committee one year after implementation. Second. Okay, so there's a second. There was one other change that appears on the motion sheet, Anna, and it says on all streets that provide access to. So it was a way of providing. That's fine, but that is part of what would be considered under the Massachusetts amendments to the manual okay. uniform control was, devices. Yeah, it was, that's something that they specify. So in order for the motion to be in accordance with that, it would have to be on it. But if, if that is. Uh, an amendment folks insist on being in the actual motion, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Councillor Haneke. I'm gonna to move to refer this to GOL with a report and recommendation to town council by December 2nd, 2024. GOL or TSO? Um, sorry, TSO. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the, you're going to put the second motion on the table. Well, I moved the first motion to be referred to TSO because there's a motion already on the table. I see, okay, thank you. Um, is there a second to- I, I will second, Ryan. Okay. All right. Uh, May I speak to it? Please. So I disagree with the report or memo that says it's a simple motion to approve the establishment um, at both locations, this does not require a benefit of a committee referral. It's missing a key required information that the memo itself said is required before school zones are created, which is um, item three of the MUTCD conditions not provided, plan of student routes and limits of school zone. The motion that was made before my motion to refer says, just leave it up to someone else. That is bad legislative practice to not actually know what zones and what lengths and where you're voting on. The access to the high school, including two, 300 to 500 feet from school grounds, includes portions of Triangle Street, all of Mattoon Street over various things, Taylor Street, um, Gray Street, Cottage Street, streets that may not be streets. It is a very unclear motion to know where it's going. Okay. And then when you're talking about the times, the school has not been consulted on what times and the motion itself that was made includes definitive times that could not be changed unless it comes back to the council. School begins at 9.05 in the morning and the motion that was made says 6.30 a.m., two and a half hours before school begins. While school ends at 3.35 
in the afternoon and the motion says 3 p.m., that ignores the fact that at the high school there is a flex block that begins at 2.55 p.m. that the handbook allows and gives permission to seniors, and many do, to leave the building at 2.55 p.m. It does not include while there's arguments that says 6 p.m. to include sports, it ignores that there are many evening events and does not say whether they should be on for evening events. In other words, we need to talk to the school before we vote on where and for how long during the day they need to be flashing. And you can do that through a motion to refer. Uh, George, you made a second. Did you have, want to speak to that? Yeah, I, my question was along those lines, Mandy's, I think, focused it with her motion. Um, I support this. I think it's a good thing to do. I think probably everybody supports it, but there are a lot of moving parts. We do have a process that we follow, TSO, um, in terms of consulting the school and consulting DPW, consulting APD. Um, yes, it does take time, but there are just some pieces here that need to be figured out. And at least in my mind, it's unclear how just passing this tonight as the original motion proposed would resolve those. It seems it, it wouldn't resolve them. It'd be left up to whatever. And then a year later, come back to TSO. So I know it's going to take more time, um, but I think it, it's prudent for us to follow the usual process and have the, the appropriate parties weigh in, including the schools in this case, along with DPW and probably APD. Okay. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I was actually going to speak to the motion itself, the original motion and the concept behind this. Um, in, in my mind, there aren't a whole lot of choices on where something of this nature would be placed. And I believe that Guilford Mooring certainly is equally aware. I will say that there are lots and lots of students crossing the, the bottom of Cottage Street at, by and before three o'clock. So, um, if we are going to tweak a time frame, it would be probably at least 2.45 um, to start in the afternoon. My feeling about having uh, uh, flashing lights in the evening, I don't know that a lot of people walk to the school in the evening for events, so that to me is much less of an issue, but um, Triangle Street itself is, is very busy, um, we have yet to change the speed limits in that area. And can I continue talking about the original issue? Or are we still talking about sending it to committee here? Uh, the motion on the floor is now to refer to committee, okay. to TSO, would, but there's no reason you can't talk about the motion, okay. the original motion. I, I probably would not support sending it to a committee um, just for the reasons that there are not there are not that many choices in where some of this uh, instrumentation would be placed. Uh, I am I am delighted that this this topic came up. It has long been a concern of mine um, to have this an extra long pedestrian crosswalk at the top of Mattoon Street, right at the top of the hill at Triangle. And it's very unnerving as a pedestrian to be walking that. So especially during school hours, <clears throat> it would be very helpful to alert people well ahead of that. Thank you. Okay. Andy, I'm going to skip George. You have your hand up, but I'm going to go to Andy. Okay. Yeah, I uh, support the motion to refer. And I guess I'm going to uh, say several things. One is, that as a member of the select board, uh, Paul and I are probably the only two people in the room who were around when Fort River was added as an elementary school with the school zone up until that time. It was the one elementary school that did not have a school zone. And the process was very different um, and, it's, and the major work was done uh, by Jason Skeels at the Department of Public Works, and then sent to Guilford and Paul and on to the council. And it was a comprehensive study of the traffic in the area, where the signs should be placed 
that you're coming to a school zone where the school zone itself should be. Um, and it was a very impressive report. I uh, found it and sent it to the sponsors of this motion um, on the, over the weekend and can send you the link. It's, it's actually it's just a link on the uh, town website, but I think that it gives you the kind of detail that really ought to be coming in so that when we're voting, we vote, we know exactly what it is that is the location of a proposed school zone where the signs are to be placed and um, why that determination was made. There's another issue that I think needs to be explored, and I don't know if uh, uh, Guilford or Paul have any information on this, but the um, uniform uh, traffic uh, manual provides that uh, school zones have to be in um, on streets abutting the school property. Um, and I'm a little bit troubled by it because most of Triangle Street does not abut school property. It yes, abuts it the uh, community field, which is not actually owned by the schools. It's owned by the town. And uh, there's just a little teeny portion of the playing field that I think may be abutting the actual street, but it is inconsequential and it is not a location where the signs are. So I'm not sure uh, what we can do on Triangle Street. And before jumping into it, I think that we need to, we as a council ought to be knowing that information and uh, there's no way we can get there without um, making sure that the time is spent in referring it to committee. Uh, the uh, other thing that I had been thinking about a lot is that uh, the hours um, should be very easy for the elementary schools. We already have school zones, but the hours for elementary schools probably ought to be different than the hours for the um, regional schools because they operate on different schedules. And uh, I, so I'm a little bit concerned about the way that the motion is framed to just set one set of hours for all schools as if they that is what is needed and appropriate for all of the schools. And uh, I really would urge splitting out the elementary school hours from uh, regional school hours, assuming we can do the regional schools. There hasn't been much mention made of the middle school because middle school probably has uh, doesn't have the same need that the high school has. So for all of those kinds of reasons, um, I would urge that we um, adopt the amended amendment to the motion made by Councilor Haneke to refer to committee. I need to uh, take a pause in the meeting. Athena, uh, I've been informed that the uh, Zoom link on the agenda and on the town website is expired. I'm looking into that. Thank you. We're uh, in pause for the moment. It was suggested that this link that was there was the one for October 7th. Can we take a five minute recess, please? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can we take a five minute recess? Yes, we are in recess for five minutes. You can turn your mics off and your um, video off. Thank you.
We've resolved the issue. Okay, as soon as people are back, Please put your video back on to let me know you're here. We have resolved the issue. George, you're back. Uh, Kathy, you're back. Councilor Walker, are you there? Okay. Um, the link gets published in multiple locations. In one location, it was incorrect. It does not require that we terminate the meeting. Uh, Anna. So, what I'm really struggling with here is why we are insisting on bogging this down in bureaucracy and forcing it to be held under discussion by a committee when what DPW will submit to that committee is a map. Andy, I looked very closely. I read thoroughly the memo that you sent. It is a half page memo and then a map with sign placements. Jason writes incredible reports. Jason's very smart. We like Jason a lot. Guilford's also very smart. All that they are going to do is send this to the committee and then the committee is going to sit there for weeks and discuss it. TSO does great things. I'm not bashing TSO, but TSO would not be the ones to recommend specific locations of the sign. And I would argue that it would be inappropriate for TSO to argue with our Department of Public Works on where the placement of those signs should go. So much about this is dictated by the Uniform Traffic Code. We have discussed items regarding the public way at the council level without sending them to TSO before. And I think that what I would like to make sure both my co-sponsors, Kathy and Lynn also, uh, Lynn, I know you haven't had a chance to speak to this yet and I welcome uh, your thoughts as well when we wrote and decided on this memo. But when we wrote those hours, we were thinking first off with the morning hours of folks who come in early for practices and also teachers who might walk to school. And those teachers do go to school at 6.30 a.m. We were also, I'm open and in my, if my co-sponsors are also open to uh, adapt, adjusting the memo to read that the uh, afternoon hours could start at 2 p.m. or that we, um, say that the rewrite the motion to say that the hours be determined by the school superintendent. 
But I think what is really frustrating to me in this moment is that we are adding multiple levels of discussion that are not happening by the experts instead of saying we defer to the people who do this for their job to determine the placement of these signs. What TSO would be talking about is placement. Mandy, those are great points. And I'm sure that Guilford knows all of them and will make a smart decision. I don't think TSO is going to come to a different conclusion than our DPW would, and I'd be concerned if they did. So that's why we wrote the motion as we did. We are deferring to the experts in-house, Jason, Guilford, whoever else they've got down there who talks about all these great things. Um, and I, I think it's just disappointing that we're bogging things down when TSO has enough other things on its plate that it actually should be truly weighing in on. Okay, um, I, as one of the people who signed on to this, I'm going to speak to it. And that is one, first of all, the 6.30 is appropriate because of the morning movement program that takes place at the high school four days a week and at the middle school one day a week. It starts at seven o'clock and many of the students that participate in that program walk to school, to it as well as a few, that, and as well as many who come by bus. With regard to the actual motion, the one thing I raised to the two other sponsors was, I wondered if this should be referred to TSO. So there we have the difference of opinion. Thank you. Uh, and Mandy Jo. I'm not expecting TSO to question DPW. I'm expecting to be able to vote on a plan where I know where the signs are going and to ask me to vote on something that has no indication definitively with a plan on where those signs are going is just wrong. Your memo itself says four things need established and they are in an order. Item one, the facility is a school. Item two, children walk or bike to and from. And for both of those, you've you've said they're true. We we understand that. Item three, the school facility or municipality provides a plan showing the routes that students will use to walk and or bike to the school and shows the limits of the proposed zone. You admit in your memo that has not been met. And you're asking us to vote to adopt a school zone when one of the requirements has not been met. You did not provide a plan showing the routes that students will use to walk or bike to school or that shows the limits of the proposed school zone. In fact, the motion you ask us to vote on doesn't even include anything about the limits of the school zone. It just says around the schools. The fourth item is that the municipality provides written documentation of their support and or approval of the school zone. You say that will be met by our vote, but our vote will not have the map even near it or the limits of the school zone near it. That's what needs to come back to us. And that's what DPW can provide to TSO to come to us. The other one is the times, that the three sponsors have decided on the times without consulting the superintendent of the schools. It is in my opinion that the superintendent of the schools should be consulted on the appropriate times because the super superintendent of the schools and the principal are the best people to tell us when those signs should flash, not us in a committee debating on whether it should be 630 to include the morning movement program or not, or whether it should be 230 or 245 to include the early flex block opt or not. We don't even know when sports practices end. That is not our decision to make. We should be seeing and receiving that information from the schools. That has not been done, and that's why it needs to go to TSO. Andy. Yeah, um, the other group is, that's very important is the Transportation Advisory Committee, and I know that you said you consulted with the chair, but I'm um, not convinced that the chair is necessarily uh, consulted with the committee yet because um, the uh, uh, committee has several members who have been working for years on safe routes to schools. And uh, that is one of their major areas of focus. Uh, so I uh, feel like um, one of the things that always 
in the TSO process is to make sure the TA, TAC is consulted and has the opportunity to respond um, as a group because all members bring different experts to the table in that, in that uh, committee. Um, the other thing, uh, it's just awkward conversation. I don't want to go very far, but um, I've had several uh, proposals uh, one that we acted on and accepted and is uh, complete for construction on Heatherstone and the other on Southeast Street, which have met with a lot of uh, comments. So uh, it, it's, it's a process that obviously concerns the community a lot and um, it concerns the entire community, not just the users of um, whatever um, roadways are involved. Uh, so I think that there's a real reason to make sure that there is um, an opportunity for broad public uh, comment, even if it's uh, not always something that we agree with. And I think of that because um, if we um, restrict speeds on um, Triangle Street, it's not going to be an issue that's going to be viewed lightly. And the last thing that I was going to just um, report, I haven't had a chance to even talk to the committee about that, but I was approached uh, about a week ago by the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee about establishing a joint meeting to CSO and TAC to meet with Chief Ting. And a uh, number of questions. Andy, your microphone, please. A number of questions were suggested to pose to Chief Ting, including um, enforceability of school zone uh, speed limits. So there are a whole lot of moving parts here. And um, that's one of the major reasons I think that this is important to do. Um, and I guess I will add one thing. If it's a simple matter, we move quickly because we just a few minutes ago approved the university sign request, which was essentially uh, one meeting of uh, our committee and uh, a report back in action by the council. Uh, Councilor Ryan. So again, this is a good thing. It's some I agree with the sponsors. It's something we need to do, but I think we should do it in the right way. Uh, we should do it in such a way that we actually know what we're voting on when we vote. Um, so let's take our time. We'll move with all deliberate speed, but I think we should refer this to TSO. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded to refer to TSO. Okay, that's the motion we're voting on. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. No. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. No. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. No. Councillor Walker. No. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Goth here. No. Motion passes to refer. It is eight in favor and five opposed. Point of order. I think since it was an amendment to a motion, do we, we have still to go need back to, to vote? the original motion? A motion to refer supersedes the motion to adopt, and that disposes with the motion. So we don't need to. There, there doesn't need to be another vote. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the clarification. Uh, it is eight o'clock. We're going to take a real break this time. Okay. And uh, five minutes and we'll be back. Please turn your videos off and your um, sound. Thank you.
Okay, we need to begin to reassemble. Thank you. Andy, Joe, you have the copies? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, by the way, she knew you were bringing them, so she didn't make them. <laughs> All right, George, you're here. Anna, you're here. Uh, Pat is, we're waiting. And uh, Councillor Ette, you're here. Waiting for Pat. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And then, Athena, I believe that you have copies of that that you're going to give to people or to people who are not in the room, you are going to send it to them. And you are going to post it on our website immediately. It's posted on our website and in SharePoint as of right now. Okay. And... So the, for those of us in the room, um, and then as soon as me, as soon as Councilor Hineke speaks to her motion, then we're going to take a fifteen minute reading period. Okay. Thank you. And and I had brought copies to hand out to people who are in the room if they want printed copies. Right. Thank instead you. Instead of just online, um, the goal of this. It, it is a motion to substitute because it is generally fully rewritten, um, and the goal of that is. There's a couple of goals as follows. Um, one of its goals and main goal is to center the committee um, to and connect it to the repairing of harms for past actions, those caused by support of slavery and post reconstruction attempts to continue slavery's effects and the harms suffered by those individuals who were enslaved. Um, the GOL proposed charge did not mention slavery at all, and the purpose statement was rooted in dismantling racism, which is a forward-looking action, not repairing the harms for past conduct, which is what reparations is 
doing to look backwards. The GOL proposed charge did not require proposed areas to be connected to identified harm. And the goal is to keep all funding discussions and allocations directly connected to the repairing harms that have been identified um, in a hope that it might help insulate the town from any legal challenges relating to reparations because it's connecting those funding decisions to harms that have been um, experienced. It expands the committee and designates appointments to better mirror the framework of the CPAC model. Seven members with some non-affiliated members and some affiliated members related to the top two funding priority areas identified in the AHRA report, youth programming and housing, and to the overarching mission of reparations, which would be why the Human Rights Commission is identified as a sending member. It clarifies the steps and procedures for getting to adopting priority areas. Um, it identifies that the AHRA final report named four funding priorities. It requires the council to vote on the priority areas to mirror a CPA framework, which is the equivalent of the state law that sets CPA priorities at recreation, historic preservation, conservation, and affordable housing. And it requires the committee to establish feasibility, thank you, um, legality and connection to harms before making recommendations on priority areas to the council. It clarifies the process and necessary steps and procedures for getting to the council allocating funding funds from the for getting the council to allocate funds from the reparation stabilization funds with a focus on that CPA C framework. That's the funding section of the charge section. Um, and it intends to clarify that this committee is for elements of reparations that relate to the reparation stabilization fund. Um, the AHRA was tasked with proposing a municipal reparations plan and providing a final report. They provided a final report that included elements of a plan, but haven't provided an actual plan. Um, and so what the council's been doing is sort of adopting these elements without actually adopting and considering a full municipal reparations plan. Um, so these are all possible elements, but we haven't yet adopted a plan and we should do that at some point, but, um, because that plan has not been adopted, we need to establish the funding priorities. Um, they would typically have been adopted as part of a municipal reparations plan. Um, and the other, and it, it tries to clarify that the element, elements of a potential municipal reparations plan um, that may include actions outside of this committee, um, that it's not the committee's job for those elements of that potential plan. Um, for example, the additional means of repair that was referenced in a plan to be included and proposed by the HRA um, for anti-Black structural and communal racism, including public events and activities that prioritize truth-telling and reconciliation. This amended, proposed amended charge is um, not intended to have this committee deal with those potential elements of a reparations plan and to be clear that it is not this committee that would be working on those. We are also going to, after our, oops, thank you. I just pressed the wrong button. Um, after the 15 minute break for the purposes of reading, we are going to also have a period of special public comment. Uh, so we're going to begin now with a period of reading and then we'll move to special public comment and then uh, council discussion and motion and debate. And for the counselors in the room, you've received the, the charge that's in front of you that was um, on the floor from the last meeting. And then this is the clean and markup copy from uh, Mandy's motion. Okay, Anna, you have your hand up. Is there a clarifying question? I was, I think it's sort of a clarifying question. Um, after the reading period, I'm wondering if it would be permissible to invite Michelle Miller and Amal Karshabaz into the um, panelists room to discuss this as they were central and pivotal to the discussion of the GOL uh, level uh, as both the former co-chair and a former member of the, uh, um, the reparations group. Yes. Um, one other thing. Yes. What's being shown, the recreation committee should refer to the recreation commission. I said, okay. And um, was my Councilor call. <laughs> Walker, do you have a clarifying question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, counselors who are not in the room, how are we accessing the document? Hi, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that because of the cough. Go ahead again. Sorry. How are counselors who are not in the room accessing the document? 
It is on the website, both in SharePoint and on the town website for the general meeting notice. It is posted now. Can't we just okay. send as an attached and, file? And I, yes, I thank you. I, that was my next request. And I will also ask the town clerk of the town council to send it to you directly, okay? To those of you that are not in the room. So we will reconvene at 8.30. We're still in session, I'm sorry. We will begin the discussion at 8.30. Um, I had, do you want a copy? You can have mine. Oh, I have it. There was one left over. <laughs> oh, here's the pen. <laughs> Thanks, Mandy. You want one from the market? Then I have a qu uh, question. Where is Mandy's statement that she just quickly read off? Uh, if that is germane to our to our consideration of this document, that would be very helpful to have. Um, it was taped, but not supplied. Um, well, then me, how can we use it? Okay, Athena has is out of the room for the moment. Let me just wait till she gets back and we'll figure out how we'll deal with that. Okay. Thank you.
Councillor Walker. Um, is it possible for the track change version to be made available for us? Yes. I will make that available to you immediately. Thank you. Okay. I thought it was in the packet, but I guess not. Could, yeah, could you, it is in the packet. It is in the packet, but we will send it to you. Um, Councillor Haneke is going to send it to Councillor Walker, uh, Pam Rooney, Councillor Lord, and um, Bob Hegner. Thank you. I don't see her. I didn't let her in. I didn't let her in. I don't see her on there, though. I don't either. Should be okay. I'll make another note of that. Thanks.
was in the door. Okay. So I can unmute you. Okay, thank you. Pam, you're unmuted. Okay, as you complete, uh, please turn your video back on. So as you complete, please turn your video back on so that I know you're ready. Okay. Um, Councillor Haneke, you asked if you could um, have another word. Thank Sorry, you. Go I, ahead. I made an error in forgetting to thank those that I met with um, in drafting this. Um, so I spent some time with uh, Councillor Shane, um, who had some comments and had reached out to me. But I also spent some time with some former members of the well, members of the former AHRA, I guess it would be. Um, Dr. Amalkar Shabazz had some comments. We did not meet in person, but he was um, aware of this. Um, Michelle Miller um, and Deborah Bridges, along with her daughter, Anika Lopes. So I want to thank everyone who was willing to meet with me and talk to me about my concerns and this proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, the floor is open for comments. There, the floor, the discussion at this point is about the amended substitute, if you will, charge. Okay. While we're waiting for that, I'm going to move to general to a specific public comment. If there is anybody who is in the room that wants to make specific public comment to this, please make sure you've let Athena know. If there is anybody like Amakar or Michelle who are in the room but on Zoom and you wanna make, make public comment, let me know. And if there's anybody on Zoom in the audience, if you would like to make public comment regarding this, please raise your hand now. Okay, we're going to begin. We have one person in the room. Please come forward. Alex, please come on up. Okay. And Amakar and Michelle, I'll be with you in a moment. Okay. Please state your name and where you live. Okay. Thank you. My name is Alex Cox. I live at 1 East Pleasant Street in Amherst. Primarily, I would like to thank the council and the counselors who took the time to revise and specify the scope of this charge for this incredibly important committee. Please speak to the mic. <laughs> I would like to thank the council and the counselors who took the time to revise the charge to narrow the focus for this incredibly important committee. However, on my primary read through, I had two points of question that I hope will be answered through the, the discussion here today. 
Um, in the amended charge, it says ARC's mission is to implement reparations, but then it does seem that most of the implementation authority still lies with the council in the charge as amended. Um, so I'm curious if implementing reparations is truly the charge or if recommending reparations is the charge of the ARC. Um, further, it says as defined by international human rights standards, but then fails to define which standards of, are the definition that is being adopted. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Michelle Miller, former counselor and co-chair of the AHRA uh, committee, please make your comments and we'd love to see your face if you'd like to turn your camera on. Not tonight, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but it's good to see all of your faces. Um, and I, I thought I saw Dr. Shabazz's hand up. I wanted um, to give him the opportunity to speak before me, but I, it's gone down. So I'm just going to go ahead. And then um, I want to uh, thank GOL for uh, working with Dr. Shabazz and I on such a, what I thought was a, a very strong um charge and uh, had a lot of the elements in it that I think we need to move this forward. Um, I also want to thank Mandy and I think Kathy um, for delving in a little bit deeper and um, taking the time to put together um, what I think is a very thoughtful charge. Um, I really appreciate um, from my perspective that more counselors have gotten involved and I appreciate sort of the level of um, of thought that went into the, the substitute charge. There are a couple considerations that I would just, um, you know, ask you to, to think about. Um, the first being the makeup of the group, I I really, uh, or excuse me, the makeup of sort of the, the folks that would be consulted in the community, um, I really appreciate uh, the integrity of and, and agree with centering the, the most of the two inner circles of the concentric circles that we uh, outlined in our report. And I suggested to Mandy that if possible, I think it would be important to find a way to incorporate into the charge some uh, outreach to that third circle. Um, I think that we, um, in the work that we did, uh, envisioned that Amherst would have an inclusive lens when they were considering reparations. And again, I do agree that the focus should be those innermost circles, but I'd like to see something that would at least, um, at least, you know, give some guidance to the committee to do that broader outreach as well. And then the only other um, consideration I have right now, and I, I, I'm really curious to hear everyone's thoughts, is um, the the makeup of the committee, just considering that if you do identify people from those three other committees to sit on this committee, um, you're you're looking at a potentially different composition than you would be if the town manager were simply uh, accepting applications, um, you know, from the community. So you just have to kind of think about how that might work out in terms of composition um, and, and who you want this committee to sort of, uh, you know, what you would like, how you would like this committee to look based on their lived experience. So those are my comments for right now. And I do see Dr. Shabazz's hand is up as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Michelle, and for all your work on this. Uh, Dr. Shabazz, you have your hand up as well, so please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and I uh, also uh, agree with uh, all of the thank yous and points that uh, uh, Michelle Miller has raised. I just will. Um, jump straight to a, a couple of things to think about. First of all, I, I want to really say that 
uh, through the two years on the AHRA, uh, all the way from the very beginning, I was always very mindful of the, the model of the Community Preservation Act Committee. I particularly uh, advocate on the statewide level with uh, uh, Senator Miranda, with uh, Representative Bud, uh, Bud Williams and, and others in the uh, Black and Latino Caucus who've been a real spearhead, uh, as well as with our own uh, Rep uh, Mindy Dom and Senator Joe Comerford to really take a look at that as an ex um, as a way in which the, as the state itself considers how to implement uh, uh, reparations, uh, the, that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts might look at that same uh, program and in fact, think about how they can support municipal communities that embark upon uh, uh, reparatory justice initiatives to draw support from the state in the same way that Community Preservation Act initiatives both uh, involve a mix of local uh, local funds and as well as state uh, state support. So um, I'm very mindful of of the history of the act and the the implementation of this particular way um, of uh, of supporting communities in the the four uh, priority areas, the four areas of the Community Preservation Act. We did not um, completely uh, recommend that as an element of the plan we, uh, in the final report of uh, in, our, in our planning process, because in some ways it does wait on the state. I think it, it, we really need to see where the state government goes before we can fully say that a CPA model is is the way to go. I think we ought to be thinking about it. We ought to be mindful and prepared, but I don't think we should exactly uh, uh, try to fashion our uh, local uh, ARC, uh, uh, Amherst Reparations Committee, on the CPA model until, in fact, we see how the, the state uh, uh, moves in this upcoming uh, legislative period. Um, but uh, but but to be mindful of it and 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 being prepared in some ways to uh, to align ourselves with that uh, should it come about. Um, part of that is that right now the and and one of the things is this: um, local communities may not find it appropriate uh, at this point to. Um, specify three or four or five areas and say, this is it, you know, and if they're, if the harms, if the initiatives you want to work on don't fit into these three, four or five areas, then we're not, we don't want to hear it. You know, there's no, there's no framework for addressing it. Uh, in the case of, of Evanston, Illinois, which we studied in detail, we met with uh, and, and brought to Amherst the um, former counselor, alderwoman that uh, led the whole initiative in Evanston, Illinois, Robin Ruth Simmons. In the case of Evanston, as we studied, as you know, their planning process and their work started with a single initiative in the area of housing, but a single initiative. They are now have multiple other initiatives based upon community uh, uh, needs and community input uh, that, that are going in other different directions, some very specific, very localized, uh, some sort of similar to our uh, Ancestral Bridges initiatives uh, that, that they're supporting. Some are in other areas. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's, that's uh, to me, is still a great model because it puts in the driver's seat uh, the black community to be able to again uh, bring forward uh, their uh, what what they're experiencing, what they're feeling, what they believe that uh, again may not have been things that came up in our two years of consultation and work in the community. I think we did arrive at some important areas, but again, there may still yet be 
areas of, of importance, for example, in the health area, okay? We talked a lot about that. We didn't name that as a specific area, but uh, there are serious mental health needs that are not adequately addressed that uh, definitely respond to historic harms in the African uh, descendant community that you know may come forward specific needs for support of initiatives in the in the area of health and men mental health and and other uh, uh, health needs that that might uh, come forward from the community and but if we've already straight jacketed things to three four or five areas that that we name tonight then you know that might be ruled out. And we have no room then to, you know, or or we face a problem then of of uh, of an issue, uh, and going to the community and saying, oh well, you know, that's that's not what we what we said we're doing. Uh, so I really suggest uh, not going down that path, and not and therefore, uh, it, given that argument, not going down the path of expanding this committee to seven with uh, seating people from housing from recreation and from the Human Rights Commission. Because again, I think that uh, a small, nimble committee uh, that is entirely focused on the work at hand, able to, to bring forward um, uh, pro uh, proposals that meet all of the other language and criteria that's been presented here tonight, uh, I think is the better way to go than to, right at this point, try to uh, uh, you know, limit the the framework of of initiatives. So um, that's that's essentially it. I can answer any questions or try to expand any further, but I don't want to talk, take up too much time or, or or space here. But I I really suggest that piece. All, a lot of the other language here and and modifications are fine. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, that's good wordsmithing on that that part. But uh, but this particular piece. I would say uh, that, uh, uh, you know, I, I would retain from the previous draft that came through GOL, staying with the five, not putting people in from these other groups. You know, and I, and, and I just add one final thing on that. If um, in the two years that I was on with AHRA and at some point going weekly in our meetings, if someone had then came along, if you all on the council had come along and say, oh, we need a delegate from the AHRA to sit over here on on uh, the 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 Amherst uh, Human Rights Commission or this, I would have to say, whoa, I've got enough on my plate as a as a volunteer community member uh, making the AHRA meetings. I don't think I can also add to it uh, going to the meetings of another of another committee for what may be a just a limited scope of where their work dovetails with with uh, with our work. And I and so I, I I also am mindful of that as a concern to to go to people who are volunteering their times to do the housing work or to do the recreation work or or human rights work and then tell them oh and now we need you to send someone over here who will also uh, uh, have a have an additional set of meetings to go to I I just think it's a it's too much to ask and and so I do ask that you retain from the previous draft the the five member. And, uh, and, and an understanding that I'm sure the ARC will, will as appropriate, check in with recreation, check in with uh, 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 these, other, these other areas as, as needed around whatever is the particular proposal being, being worked on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shabazz, thank you so much for your comments. And again, also for your hard work on the uh, document and the work leading into this. So the floor is now open. Uh, we're closing public comment uh, and the floor is open for questions. Bob Hegner. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with um, the comments made by both Michelle and Dr. Shabazz. I also was concerned that um, expanding the, the committee or expanding the groups so that you're only getting a certain, you know, recreation, housing, so, um, Human rights, it, it it is constraining in some ways. So I do I do agree that we shouldn't be doing that. And also the idea that we identify very specific areas, um, and I don't I I also found those to be constraining. I think 
the commission can decide itself what the priorities are. And as Dr. Shabazz stated, they may change over time. So let's not, let's not try to identify specific areas where we can spend money uh, versus uh, you know, giving the, com the commission the authority to come up with some good ideas and then bring them to the council. So, and I, I agree with the commenter that this is a, we're really making, uh, the committee really should make recommendations. It's not a decision-making body. The council is the one that has to decide how to spend money. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I wanna preface that, this mic is so loud. I wanna preface this by saying there are certainly things where I've highlighted and said, oh, I like this. So know that that does exist. Generally, I do need to say that as the chair of GOL, I find it frustrating that feedback from these counselors was not provided to GOL if they had thoughts about what this committee should look like. And instead a full substitute motion was proposed. Uh, we had multiple rounds of committee discussion and did not receive com comments from other counselors. So just as a general practice, if folks have feelings about how something should look, please tell your committees. And if you didn't know what those feelings were until you saw our charge, fine. Um, okay. It is wild to me that the world word black does not appear in this charge once. And the only time African heritage, the words African heritage are mentioned are when referencing the AHRA. There are certainly other groups who have uh, been enslaved in the United States and deserve reparations, the harm that they face may be different, right? The, the structural inequities may look different. The report and the research done by the AHRA specifically focused on those of African heritage and to expand, potentially expand this charge by removing those words, uh, I think I I just want to note that ex that could expand the charge. Um, I believe we absolutely need to strike the membership from other committees. We just heard today from one of these committees about how overextended they are. We can't keep placing additional work on these committees, and I understand that the intent with adding those was to mimic CPA, but this committee isn't functioning like CPA functions yet, right? This committee is creating all of the things that CPA already has. So maybe at a later date, this might be revised, this charge might be revised and revisited to add those in. But right now, I think it's far too big a lift to be asking of someone who's already serving on another committee when some of those areas may not end up being addressed uh, by this committee. Um, Consulting, is it okay if I keep going? No one's telling me now. Okay. Consulting only with those in eligibility groups one and two is one, not enforceable. Uh, we know that there's such, the, the, we know that there's so much behind proving uh, ancestry and it also ignores the, uh, so this is in the priority areas. It says, Consult regularly with the descendants of enslaved Amherst residents and residents of Amherst whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States regarding Amherst reparations program to inform the program and recommendations made to the council, citing eligibility groups one and two in the HRA final report. Um, this also ignores structural harm that has occurred as a result of long-term result of, uh, of slavery in the United States. I do appreciate the add of um, adding connection to the harm being repaired to the piece around priority areas. Uh, but those were three things, four things that stood out to me right away. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> um, I agree with much of what Anna said, so I will try not to be repetitive, but I, you know, some of the comments I took was that this is a successor committee to the HRA. 
as much as it has a slightly different purpose, that is where this work is coming from. And so I also agree strongly with the removing of the word black or African heritage from the charge completely. Um, <clears throat> I also agree with everything said about the membership. I, I think it doesn't make sense to add those members, but maybe, you know, they can consult those members. And I don't, I mean, those other committees, and I don't think that that necessarily needs to be in the charge. I think they already have that option to consult those committees. Um, there were, I, I just feel conflicted because there were some suggestions that the wording was fine and didn't feel like I don't feel strongly about removing it, but there was a lot that I feel strongly about changing. And so I also just wanted to point out, similar to what Anna said about the process, I feel like I didn't have enough time to process this and I don't necessarily want to continue to drag this out, um, but this feels like a lot right now. And so I'm slightly overwhelmed also. Um, there were a lot of other things that I think were unnecessary to add. The connections to harm being repaired is nice, but I think if we're looking at the HRA report, they made all of those connections to the, those areas that are suggested in the report already. We have the full history outline in another report. And so maybe if they're going to suggest a priority area that wasn't recommended by the AHRA, we might ask for them to point out the connections to the harm being repaired. But I think all of that has already been done. Um, I also feel like some of this was written as if this isn't going to be an ongoing committee, right? Like we want your recommendation and then this, but I don't think it leaves it open enough for things to change over time. This will be a standing committee. And so a lot of the way that this was written, it sounds like they're producing, you know, one report, one set of recommendations. And so I didn't like that either. Um, and I also think the CP, the recommendation for this to be set up like CPA could just be a personal recommendation. I don't think we need to require them to set it up like CPA. I think that's an option, but I also think we want to leave this open for the members of that committee to recommend to us what they think it should look like and for, for that to be open for them to decide. Um, and yeah, I, I have a few other things, but I think basically it's getting to the point of like, I could go line by line and say, I think some of these words should be changed. I think this is not needed. And so I, I don't really know how we go about that in a meeting with, I'm sure all of the other counselors have a similar thing going on right now. So uh, I'm feeling pretty conflicted. Thank you for raising that, Councillor Walker. Let's get through the comments and then see how we proceed. Okay, Kathy. I, I think what Alicia just raised is that we may need a working group to have a line by line discussion of this, but let me just uh, say what I think is the motivation of trying to restructure what we originally received. I see these as tax dollars, they're public tax dollars. And the more we have a couple places, we're not saying which areas might be reparative. Um, the HRA had a long list and they narrowed it to a few high priority, but I think without some initial and to the, is the initial set of three to five in, carved in cement? Not necessarily, but it allows you to be clear when you're going out and asking for proposals. And how else do you make comparisons of proposals if you have 20 proposals and each is a one-off. How do you judge them, cluster them, do anything with them? So it's spending, the, I saw this charge is starting to think of how do we spend the stabilization fund we put up for reparations and trying to link it back to the harm and the resolution we originally passed, which very much anchored it in if we need to put the words back in, to slavery and the post-reconstruction uh, discrimination in housing and employment in a long list of things that happened here in Amherst um, and trying to think of that. And the report already identified some areas. So I think you know, the two steps of saying narrow to a set of three to five, six areas, because then you've got to do, you've got to say, why are these feasible? How would you do them? and then solicit proposals 
people have to know what areas they're proposing in. And then you have to have some way of comparing them and coming them back for potential funding. So those three, three elements I didn't find in the original charge of trying to first come. And I do think we never had, I kept hoping the council would have an hour long discussion about the report we received and take a vote on some specific areas that we thought would work, that were feasible. Um, we can't do individual awards based on uh, race. Um, so which kinds of things so that we would get some buy-in. We never had that discussion. We welcomed all the hard work that came into the report. So we've missed that step. So this is written in a way that this successor group, whether it's five people or seven people, maybe it goes back to five, comes with, we've read the report. We like the four or five priority areas that were selected, and that's our starting point. And they come back to the council and say, this is our starting point. We say, that sounds like a good idea. Where they've created some, this is why we pick them. And then the second thing would be the way to set up a process of getting proposals. CPA is probably just one model, but it is a model we have in town with a post. We're open now for proposals. You have a simple little form. You fill, out, fill it out without a lot of things and say how much money you want and why. And then the committee has a very open discussion about the relative merits. And I'm expecting that the proposals will come in for more dollars than are available. So there's gotta be some way of saying relative merits and coming back. So those are the two main steps that were outlined in this memo that I, in this charge that I didn't find in the original one. Narrowing it to a few areas, whatever they are, and come back with a justification of why those on the same wording that was in the original draft charge of feasibility and wh why why this should be a priority with some description. You know, it's it, having sat as a liaison to CPA, it's been very helpful for the members to have a definition of which of the areas they can fund, just a working definition, because they can bounce it off like this fits, this doesn't fit, and it helps them get to a narrow group of saying it doesn't fit. And I do want to step back that that was set up by legislators and then it was voted by the town of Amherst, the CPA dollars. So there was a legislative process that said, these are areas we think of preservation. They could, I think the state should expand it to climate and some other pieces, but it's not in the state legislation, so we can't spend Please. dollars in those areas. Yeah. Let's stick to the So I'll issue. just, I'll just, so that's a reason for narrowing it and coming back and saying, this is the areas that we're gonna solicit proposals in, and then a process for how do you decide and come back with the proposals. So I, I think some of the, whether it's five people or the expanded, the expansion was mirroring CPAC, which is bringing in someone who knows someone about housing from the housing coalition. So if housing isn't one of the priorities, maybe that doesn't make sense. So I just wanna say the two pieces of trying to identify areas and why, drawing on the report we received, and then talk about a process on how the decisions would be made before it comes back to us for funding. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Pat? I'm going to ask Councillor Ette to go first, and then I'll follow him. Okay. Councillor Ette? I actually think this replacement charge is a better charge because the focus is more limited. And what is more limited means there's a greater probability that you could find if it works or it doesn't work. One of the things about the previous charge that I had was that I imagined what would the town look like in five years if we actually voted yes on that charge and no image came to mind. But I think with this particular charge, with a more limited scope, it's this, this room to see what failure or success would look like. Is it perfect as it is? Absolutely not. I think, therefore, some of the concerns that have been raised are concerns that if they 
if this replacement were sent back to GOL with comments from councillors, we could work both in terms of the scope and in terms of the language that is used. So my question would be, is there a way for this to be sent to GOL and how, what would that look like? Okay, Pat. Thank you. Um, I also uh, like this expanded charge, but I have some questions. And my first question is why didn't you reach out to GOL? I think Anna's comment is important, particularly after uh, the frustration some of you felt because um, it, it wasn't being, you know, the charge about the safety zones wasn't done in a certain way. I find that frustrating um, that you didn't come to the committee. The, but I do, I do find much in this that I like. Uh, to me, and you know, I am a white person, so I see I have limits to what I am. I can notice, um, but it, it it is interesting to me that I don't have a problem with the word black coming back into the title. But it, it interests. It's caused. We're, we're talking about harms caused by the support of slavery and post-Reconstruction discrimination by the town. I have a question. Post-Reconstruction, how far does that go forward? Does it go into the 50s? Does it where uh, housing mortgages were denied to people in Amherst, Black people in Amherst? Um, how, what do we mean by that? And I think that's an important thing. I also feel that I agree with Kathy that, and there there does need to be a beginning process. And I think modeling it on the CPA model feels okay. I would like to see healthcare re, uh, be one of the priorities and not youth programming per se, but education, because that would encompass youth programming. And I see those issues as issues that still today affect people in our community. I'm thinking about a close friend who's, whose grandmother died because she didn't receive the medical care she needed because the doctor was ignoring her headaches and she died of an aneurysm. This was a woman of color. So that there is consistent, even now, discrimination in healthcare. And that feels to me like it needs to be a priority. Um, you know, Dr. Shabazz, I have great respect for you and for Michelle and the work that has happened. But I also want to say you've set some limits. Uh, you've set some initiatives. And I don't have a problem with starting with certain areas. When you talk about what happened in Evanston, we're, it's clear they started just with housing. And then they changed it as, and they expanded it as they discovered from the community what they needed. Um, so I don't have a trouble. I don't have trouble setting priorities as long as there is a sense of flexibility about that. Um, it feels incredibly important to me that we're consulting regularly with descendants of a slave um, Amherst residents and and all members of the black community in Amherst because they face regular discrimination um, based on the color of their skin. We know that. We know that, and it happens every day in Amherst. It happens, no, I'm not gonna say some of the stories that I know. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with creating a beginning a process and also setting areas. Um, I don't get the sense that this is gonna die at the end because it says shall report annually. To me, that means it's ongoing. Um, I feel strongly that it would be good to expand um, this um, committee to have members representing committees that focus on the prior the initial priority areas. Uh, I'd love to see people from housing. I'd like to see somebody from the health department. Um, I think if this is a real priority of the town, people will re re come forward um, 
to meet and work on this committee. Um, and I think it is a priority. I think it's a really important priority. Uh, I think that's all of what I have to say right now. Yeah. Councilor Ryan. My sense in reading at least some of this is that it may have been motivated by, <clears throat> by a desire to protect this from possible legal challenge. So some of the, the language changes may be connected to that. And that might be something that would need further discussion. Um, I appreciate very much the addition of the notion of harm in the purpose section. And I think that's important and I'd like it to stay. I do have a question about the word implement, um, I think, but this, this gets into wordsmithing, but I do appreciate that aspect of the proposal. There obviously are a number of very specific uh, proposals made in, in the sections, providing guidance, if you want to call it that, or direction, um, trying to narrow the, the scope, um, all I think meant in, in uh, for good purpose, but are complicated. And I think perhaps the question before us this evening is if the majority of us feel that at least some of that direction providing and narrowing of scope is helpful, then this definitely needs to go back to GOL and needs to be looked at in greater detail. If you don't feel that way, then perhaps we should go back to the original charge. Um, but I would feel that that we're certainly not going to wordsmith this tonight. So um, if we're going to move forward, it would be a decision of whether you feel that this is something that GOL should look at much more closely. Obviously, we'd be getting comments from everyone as well. And I want to echo something that Kathy said that uh, I think others may have alluded to it, that we've never really had the conversation that we should have had on the AHRA report. And I, for one, would, um, not that we need to add to our agenda, but I think that would be a conversation that would be well worth having. I'm gonna skip over Kathy and go to Councilor Lord, who's not spoken yet. Thank you. Um, I want to um, amplify or lift up and second um, what Anna, and Councillor Walker said a lot of their points I'm in direct alignment with. I also do think it should stay or go back to the five member committee and not adding other people. Um, when we, the two years we were on the AHRA, we reached out to experts when we needed it, whether it was the Donahue Institute, whether it was housing. And I'm very confident that the committee members can do that without having somebody be at every meeting. Um, and then, yeah, I would like to see Black get in there as well, because then you could have a committee of nobody who's connected or descended to any of that harm. Um, so we had it in our charge. I don't know what it would look like, but um, in terms of some of the residents. And uh, what was that? One more thing. I don't know enough about this, but I thought we passed a home rule, which would then we wouldn't get in trouble for legally having specific funds based on race. When I was on the committee, I think we came to you and I don't really know how that works legally, but I thought that we had done that so that we wouldn't be in legal trouble. And there's more to say, but I think right now that's where I'm at. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Shabazz to speak again before I have a comment. Uh, on my car. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Lynn. I, I, this is a very good point that that Holla raises that I wanted to come in on. You know, um, we don't have a home rule uh, measure passed yet, uh, not for Amherst in particular, and not at a statewide level. In my discussions with uh, Rep. Dom and and Senator uh, Comerford and others, this is the the crux of the matter. Um, you know, besides the fact that we've kind of got other things in the queue for home rule uh, from Amherst, such as, um, you know, ranked choice voting and, and I think something else, uh, even besides that, that issue, what the representatives, the senators have raised is why just Amherst? If we're looking at it on a statewide level, why don't we declare reparations as a public purpose for any community in Massachusetts, 
rather than just starting with Amherst. You know, I, I came back with the argument, well, Amherst starts with an A, so let's start with Amherst, and then we'll make the case for statewide. Well, it's kind of gotten tied up there. That's part of the discussion at the state level around um, the two bills that were in the mix last year that didn't move forward. Is this, is this uh, you know, or, or, and that we look to perhaps move forward this year. But until it is declared a public purpose, we are restricted in what we can do. So why restrict the scope uh, uh, in answer to Councillor Frecke? That's why it's not a good idea to restrict to two, three, whatever, you know, areas right now, because we don't, because we're very limited in what we can do right now until reparations is declared a public purpose in the way that community preservation has been declared a public purpose. So for example, the Goodwin Memorial Church can get money through a CPAC grant to do electrical work and fix up that historic black treasure in our community from tax dollars because community preservation historic preservation and community preservation is a public purpose. But we could not do it through the Amherst uh, Reparations Committee or Amherst Black Reparations because reparations is not yet a public purpose. Same entity in the community, but we can't do it. We, or rather, we'll face legal challenge from somebody saying, oh, that's that's racist, you know, and you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't help. You know, they could, they could, Go to court, take us to court if we did it as a reparatory justice measure. But if we do it as a community preservation me measure, we're perfectly fine because it's been immunized at the state level that that's a public purpose. So I do implore you, don't straitjacket this thing right now to two, three limited areas because right now we're already straitjacketed by the fact that we have not uh, immunize this process yet by getting reparative justice as a public purpose so that municipalities can make grants to individuals or to groups or to institutions uh, uh, for that purpose. So I just wanted to, to, to mention that again or bring that out. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just make one or two comments. I don't want to get into the debate. I do think there's a possibility that we need to refer this back, Anna. <laughs> um, but before that, I also want to ask, um, and that is, this uh, charge has, as did the other one, has several references in it. And I know we don't tend to put links in charges, but it seems to me that we should at least put some footnotes here so that people know which documents we're referring to and that there's no debate as to, as to those documents. Having said that, I'm, I'm not gonna get into any of the other comments at this point. I'm gonna go to Jennifer who has not spoken yet. Thank you. So I was just gonna say that I was prepared to vote to approve the charge at the last council meeting. Is that still, um, is the that motion that's on, on the, the table, table is this okay. charge. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, the, you, the motion that is on the table at yeah. this point, the active one, is the amended charge. Yes. Um, Anna. Okay. Uh, my notes are in seven different places. All right. Um, I, at the last meeting, when there was a vote to send this back to GOL, I did not vote in the affirmative because... It was a vote to refer without specific language suggestions and comments. GOL had discussed it, had written a charge, had sent it to council. Um, I am comfortable with this getting referred back to GOL because there are concrete things for us to discuss beyond just what GOL brings up with the, with the folks that we have in the room. Um, and I want to thank Kathy for forwarding me a memo that she had written last term of the council regarding uh, the AHRA successor body. Um, that was not in the, this is like a bigger picture of how we do carryover memos because this was not, I had never seen it. So it's something that I think we need to figure out how to include feedback like that if an item is being carried over um, because otherwise future committees are in this boat. So 
learning opportunity here for all of us. Uh, and Mandy, if you also sent comments, I didn't receive them. So know that that was not an intentional oversight on GOL's part. We didn't know. Um, do, 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 do. George brought up uh, questions regarding legal, and that is something that GOL could seek on a committee charge. I don't know if that's necessarily uh, required in this particular instance as much as it would be if we started to pursue the public purpose route, which would be a separate issue altogether. Um, and then I, I really do, this is something that if this, uh, and I'm prepared to move to send this to GOL, um, but I would once again, strongly recommend that for this iteration of the charge, we remove the representatives from other committees. Once there's a process and this functions more like CPA, it makes sense to bring them in. But until then, I do think it's an overburdening uh, of their uh, time and it may not always be relevant to them. I would like to make sure everyone has a chance to speak um, and but folks just know who are lined up to speak that I'm prepared to make a motion to send this to GOL whenever you'd uh, indicate that to me. Thank you. Um, and I, I'll come back to you to make that motion. Um, we now have people who have all spoken, so I'll go on to Councillor Ette. I think uh, Councillor Walker had her hand before me. Um, I'm going in the order that the hands appear to me, so. Okay. So in that case, I would, first of all, I think correct um, Councillor Devin Gautier. I don't think we had a vote to refer this to GOL. We, at the last meeting, there was a vote to refer it back to GOL. There, I made the motion and it was motion. and it was defeated. It was defeated? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but hey, you got to stand up and be prepared to be <laughs> shot down. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think what is being discussed is a straight jacket. I think there is a spectrum in which you could have a straight jacket and you could simply be so completely free that anything goes. And if we look at the previous charge, it speaks of just, it, it's, it's so broad that there's no way to measure what success would be. And I think what we could go do is aim for one and then expand as the case may be to others as they come. I don't think there's anything in the replacement charge that limits that scope in that way. So I am in favor of sending this back to GOL, in favor of getting the comments from counselors and the public who will be able to, I think, enrich what we have as a starting document for something that will be better. Okay. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you. I have a couple of process questions. Um, just because I've never seen this happen in my time engaging with the council, is it possible to change a committee charge once a, a committee is already established? Yes. And is that as simple as proposing, like proposing a motion about it, and then we just vote on it, and then it's changed, or is it a different process? It it can happen in a couple different ways. Somebody could bring it forward uh, from the council. The committee itself could bring it forward. There have been times when we have asked. In fact, we try to regularly ask uh, the council committees to look at their charges and come forward with proposed changes. So th it's an option. Okay. And if the thing that we were looking to change was something like the member composition, would that pose different difficulties or no. challenges? That's That would be part of changing the charge. That could okay. be done. Okay. Um, and then I'm also wondering, just because I've also only been able to engage with GOL when they're discussing a resolution that I'm sponsoring, because I, I don't really have a lot of time to be going to all committee meetings. Um, but if I wanted to engage with this process, am I able to attend a GOL meeting and participate in a way other than just public comment? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, There's a way to do it. We can always post it as a general meeting. 
or we can always make sure there's not a, over a quorum of the council. There's ways to do it. You um, may I interject as the chair of GOL for a moment? Yes. Uh, Alicia, I also would welcome any written comments and I'm happy to sit down with you individually to capture those. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anna. Yeah, I will send in my written comments. The only thing, and you know, this is not for just only this motion, but I think lots of things we do, is it's hard because I then can't comment on other comments that were sent to you. Um, and so then how to really come to a consensus if the people sending written comments aren't able to communicate. Um, yeah. So I think that was my only, I thought I had something I mean, else, but I forget. So that's. We have to figure out the best way to do that without breaking open meeting law at any time. Okay. One of the ways is to provide some written comments. Councillor Haneke. I also want to go to Michelle Miller, who has her hand up. I, I will try to keep this short. Um, Anna, I, and I believe Councillor Steinberg were also people who submitted comments to GOL before this transition on this matter when GOL discussed it. And I think we had all assumed that GOL was taking them into consideration in this last round of discussions. So please read um, Sorry about that. Nope, um, you're good. Um, I want to affirm um, what Councillor Ryan said about an attempt to, um, or a thinking about potential legal challenges to a charge and why certain words were removed and certain connections were brought forward as clarity. Um, obviously, I don't know what legal challenges might be, but it was certainly in part of my discussions with everyone and in thinking about this draft, that potential for legal challenges, particularly with regard to recent Supreme Court decisions on um, affirmative action and responses to that in terms of referencing particular um, racial categories was definitely a consideration in terms of language that was used here. Um, so I just wanted to state that as one of the reasons for removal of things and, and but then re-referencing prior actions of the council. Um, at, at this point, that's all I'm going to say to move this discussion along. Okay, Michelle? Yeah, one of the things that I that I think is important to think about is when we were naming the priority areas, we were really thinking about feasibility in the context of reparations not being identified as a public purpose yet. So if we take health care, for example, which has come up a couple of times in this meeting, and I think many of us agree is a really important um, priority, we thought about, well, where could tax money in Amherst right now go to alleviate the harms related to Black residents and health care? So if we just think through that question, like, is it the Musanti Center? Is it like, where do you put the money in a way that would, you know, um, actually work to 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 address the harms that have existed for and, and exist up until this day. So I just, again, theory and practice are two different things. I think, you know, we have a lot of theory right now, um, but when we get into the practice, and I think this is why Evanston really they still, they continue. I just looked at their most recent agenda. They've been working on this for two or three years and they're still limited to housing because they have found a way to, to really be able to justify taking tax dollars and using it for housing purposes. So I think that we may, while I really appreciate the thoughtfulness, and I think that this charge is something that we are going to get to eventually, I just encourage us not to overthink it right now. Like at this point, I think what we need to do is 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 get in there and start doing the messy work and as as best we can, you know what I mean? And I think that really thinking about feasibility um, with respect to where these dollars can go without 
there being a named, you know, that reparations is not named a public purpose right now. And so we have to consider, while it may seem more like we came up with programmatic or or sort of more general uh, priority areas, there were reasons for that, given, uh, you know, the limitations that we have. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Anna? Yes, I'd like to rem uh, refer the proposed amendments to the charge for the Amherst Black Reparations Committee to GOL. Is there a second? second. I'll make a second. Rebecca has made the second. Okay. We're now, the discussion is only about the referral unless you have additional messages you would like to send to the committee. Councillor Walker. Um, I just have another process question. So we don't have to vote on the amendment itself. Like the other motion is just completely off the table now because we have a new proposed motion. We're, we're not, everything is now being referred back to GOL. Referral means we don't vote on anything else. Just like the previous thing that we did with the speed zones. Right. So I'm just trying to understand then what happens with what was the proposed motion or charge before? Does it just disappear or do both go back to GOL? It all goes back to GOL. Yeah. Okay. And GOL will come forward with a proposal to the committee for a charge. Okay. Nothing's lost, but there's no motion on the table except to refer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. If the referral fails, the yeah. motion to amend is back on the table. If that fails, the original motion would right. be back on the right. table. Correct. Thank you. Um, are there any other further comments or questions? Okay. This is a motion to refer. Uh, we start with Lynn Griesmertz and I, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. And I want to thank all of you for, first of all, coming forward with a substitute motion, which has in, led to an enlivened discussion. The next motion is not relevant because it was to vote SMA, SME status. Um, we're going to now move to, to discussion of the F of the 2025 town manager goals. And this is Anna. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk through the report that I sent in because I sent it in so late and I apologize for that. I'm, get, I'm getting better, I included the members in this report, so we're getting there. Um, so one of the things that GOL is, uh, was, was working on is the process and establishment of the 2025 town manager goals. And we talked about you you introducing the purpose of these goals, George, would you, would you like to do that? Or would you like to do it? All right. Say something. I've got it George, George wrote something down that he's going to read. And then I'm going to read what I wrote down. So take it away, George. So we thought it might be helpful just very briefly to um, think about why we do this. Um, I think actually this is something setting of the, the goals, performance goals for the town manager is one of the most important things we do as, as a body is my personal opinion. I don't think it's easy, but I think it's important. So the committee thought it might be useful just to begin with a brief statement about the reasons behind why the council goes through this yearly exercise. So in our discussion at the last meeting, um, we identified uh, four reasons we thought were most relevant. The first is this exercise is crucial in helping the 13 of us come to some consensus about the council's top priorities for the coming year. It, focus, it forces us to think hard and think collaboratively. Secondly, in providing these uh, performance goals, these priorities, it assists the town manager in allocating limited staff time and resources in support of these priorities. He has said on many occasions that this document that we create is a document he shares with all his department heads. 
Third, it's a public document. It's available to everybody, spelling out what matters most to us as a body and where we want to focus our collective energies and efforts. I don't believe that I'm the only one who shares this document with constituents when they ask me about the council and what it does. We are the policy-making body, and this is our key policy-making statement. And finally, it serves as a historical record of council commitments, which can be consulted over time, and against which we ourselves, for better or worse, can be measured both in the long and the short term. So for those four reasons, there are probably others, um, just to remind us of why we go through this process. Thank you, George. So one of the things that I have noticed about the goals that we tend to establish or that we have used for the town manager is that first, we establish them in a narrative form, but second, they're not consistent in the way that they're presented. Some of them are very actionable and specific. Some of them are broader directions that we'd like the town manager to go. So what I proposed to the committee was a new way of organizing the town manager goals, which would allow for increased clarity of actionable items, as well as objectives, meaning the direction that we want to go. The committee agreed to provide the full council with an update uh, and seek your feedback on both the direction we're going and the goal areas as we continue. We will discuss this feedback at our next meeting and continue to seek your input on objectives and action items for 2025, and co including considerations of items from 2024 to carry over. So the way that the, the framework works, there's a table um, in, the, in the memo that you were provided. We would be able to track specific action items and differentiate them from bigger picture objectives. I, I want to pause for a moment and ask the clerk to put the table up on the screen. Thank you. Uh, differentiate the action items from bigger picture objectives. It also allows us to note whether goals are new, carried over from a prior year, and if they're in progress or complete. Lastly, it more clearly specifies the number of objectives and action items per goal area, allowing the council to set a reasonable number of goals to be accomplished in the coming year. Like George said, the, the town manager goals, while they're called the town manager goals, also reflect the priority areas of the council. So the way that this, uh, the I'm calling it a framework, that's just a fancy way to say table right now, so it's just a table. Uh, the way it, what it includes are the following. The first is goal area. These should look pretty familiar. This includes uh, broad topics of both legislative and management goals. These have stayed relatively similar year over year and are the umbrellas under which the objectives and action items fall. These communicate the areas of priority for the town. Objective outlines the direction of movement the council would like to see within that goal area. These are not necessarily tangibly actionable, but they provide direction to the council and the town manager, and they also serve as those priority priorities. And then action items. The action item column represents the tangible actions that the town manager is to move on in the coming year or within a longer time frame, as noted. These should be specific items that can undoubtedly be completed within the given time frame. It's possible that for some years, an objective may not have a specific action item, but it's not necessarily removed as it's still a priority action for the council or the town manager is determining the action item within it on his own. And then lastly, status. The status column allows the council to note whether a goal is new or a carryover from a prior year, whether it has been started or not, and what uh, would also be the appropriate place to note if an item is to be completed in longer than just a year. So what I tried to do is give you sort of an example of what this would look like. Um, and the reason why I didn't go further was the way that our, our current goals are written, Half the things that are numbered as action items aren't actionable, right? Um, or aren't actionable in a specific way. They could be interpreted in four different directions. So I tried to pull just in one area, I just pulled a couple things over to show you the difference, specifically the difference between an objective and an action item. So under climate resilience, the example that I gave, the objective, the big picture would be to continue to make progress on the council's climate action goals and to prepare the town to be resilient in the face of climate change. That's something that is a broad area. We had that listed as our objective before. Uh, and then the example of that could be complete the joint powers entity formation and implementation of the CCA, right? So, and we would note that this was a carryover and Paul eventually would tell us it was complete. 
The other, one of the other areas I pulled over uh, into the objective column was support the development of climate action focused bylaws. That's not a tangible when we then go on to specific to specify which bylaws we want them to work on. So if that's the objective, if that's one of the, the directions we wanna go, meaning we want to write more climate action focused bylaws, the action item specifically would be prioritize staff time to developing a waste hauler bylaw and prioritize, prioritize staff time to developing a solar bylaw. These are all things the council needs to vote on. Every single thing on this, the council should be signing off on at least a majority of us need to agree. So these, these two examples are not these are in the 2024 goals. These were voted on. I didn't make these up. Um, but I wanted to, to differentiate between an objective and an action item so that when we're going through and evaluating Paul's work, we're able to say he made progress towards his objective through doing X, Y, Z that we asked him to do, not our interpretations of what that objective means. It's not fair that we if we all have different interpretations of an objective and what it looks like to complete it. Um, and then the last thing was that this, we, Paul was at our GOL meeting and we discussed this with him. And one of the things we talked about, um, I started counting, I got to like 36 and then I was called on uh, the number of action, action of, of numbers, the, thing, the number of things we have here for Paul to do. That's a lot. Um, and while Paul is extremely capable and his staff are extremely capable, we talked about trying to limit our number of objectives. And so we're going to, to think through, GOL will think through the process by which to do this, but what we'd like to get to is no more than three objectives. And again, an objective is a big picture vision, like what direction do we want to go in the coming year? Uh, no more than three per goal area. That's still a lot to be very clear. And we still will want to limit the number of action items because action items are different in scope. We are not setting an, a set number um, for, of action items at this time, but once we get whoa, sorry, once we get feedback from the council, we'll go through and we'll talk with Paul about what is feasible in the year versus how many long-term goals do we want in there. So we're trying to bring this a little bit more towards best practices and goal setting, but also to get a bit more clarity when we then go back to say, what have we done in the past year of the direction for, for Paul and the council and the action items for Paul. And I'm happy to take comments. The other thing that I would like folks to consider and individually send me as GOL chair feedback on is are these goal areas still what you want to keep as the goal areas? I'm not offering my own interp my own opinion on that, but that step one is are the goal areas still true? And again, goal areas are not a perspective on where we want to go. It's just saying, saying these are the umbrellas. Within the, that, we'll have the objectives. GOL folks, did I miss anything about our conversation that I should mention? That was my monologue. I'm happy to take any comments people have about this. Uh, you can you can take the screen down now. Uh, Kathy. Uh, first, I like the direction conceptually. Uh, I did just a really quick count as you were talking, and there are 14 goals, although one seemed to be repeated, just a line was exactly the same. So we need to focus on whether we really have 13, 10 distinctive, as opposed to some of the goals or a subset of something else. Sorry, Kathy, to clarify, do you mean goal areas? Yeah, the just so the, like first, the bigger the first, climate the action column. Yes, you know, okay. the very first. So racial equity and social justice appears twice. So I don't know whether you meant it to. That gets probably you. not. That's probably a typo. Okay, there, so there's there, 13. There, are th there, there are 13 total. There are 13. So if you multiply 13 times, you're trying to limit it to three. We're still at 39, right? So so take when you're thinking about what's in them, some of them subparts of our goals seem to me to repeat in another goal. So when that happens, it means they're, the goals are distinct from each other. And I don't know where to group it, but just think about what the umbrella is when it's a goal. So that's just, you know, I'm not saying which ones, but when I found, when Lynn gave us this little exercise of rating and then pieces of it, I said, I'm finding pieces of a goal in another goal. And I'm trying to figure out whether I rate it higher when it appears in this goal than when it, yes. so just, you know, trying to limit it. So I think 
a limited amount of things that we think are really high level, and then your your effort to get it down to something called an action item may be a challenge when you look at some of these goals. I'm prepared to take it on. You know, so just it works better with climate because we had a couple of specific things that we were hoping would get done. Once they're done, you're going to have more difficulty populating it. So just thinking it through, it's not that the goal is wrong. It's just the action item may I, be less clear. Thank you, Kathy. And I think that's why that's why the introduction of the objective and limiting it to three while on the face of it seems like a lot is so important because if there isn't a tangible, if there isn't a tangible action, we need to consider why it's in there, what purpose is it serving? And then is it in fact an objective that we're trying to reach and we need to think about what is the action step towards this? And then I think we're going to find we have way more than three. I agree with you, three is probably too many, but we're going to start there. Uh, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, I, I like the format. I like I like the the idea of creating this kind of framework. Um, the action items I think that we've been talking about are we we've sort of argued back and forth between broad objectives, broader objectives, and then these action items. And I think we were told last time that we didn't want we didn't want very specific little actions because that was too limiting and it sort of filled the airwaves with lots of little stuff. So um, I think there are always action items that are associated with an objective. An objective is um, specific, it's measurable, it's actionable, and it's timely. So yeah, there are going to be a bunch of things that serve that purpose, you know, that create the the filling behind the objective. Um, but but again, um, I'd be I'd be interested in sort of helping sort and plug things in. But I like the I like the direction it's going. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Um. So I wanted to thank both. Anna and George for bringing this forward because I think in my time on the council, this is one of the important things that we all take part in, but it's hard to actually get meaning or value out of it because of the way that I think we all interpret it differently. Um, and so I think that this helps at least us to align our interpretation. Um, and so basically uh, some of the things I'm wondering, and I, I think you all are still working on these things, so I don't expect any answers, but just how are we deciding what the three action steps are? Because I think part, although I don't think we would all exactly agree on the broad objectives, I think we might agree on the objectives and then not agree on like, what are the three action steps that would point us towards what those objectives are? And so how are we deciding what those are? Um, and then when we are looking at doing the actual evaluations, are we then asking counselors to only take those things into consideration when writing their evaluation? Or are we allowed to consider things that maybe other counselors didn't think or didn't make it for some reason into the three action steps? And how do we plan to account for those things are in, evalu in our evaluation? <clears throat> I'm um, sorry, excuse me. I think those are my main questions, but I do think that this is an incredibly important step in the right direction towards becoming a lot more organized with this process. Um, and so I really appreciate that you all are taking this on. Um, and you might have said this, Anna, I apologize if I missed it, but if there is something you all need from other counselors to help move this along, can you please repeat what the ask was there? Yeah, so to repeat the ask right now, there will be many other asks to be very clear right now the ask is to look at the 13 i'll send a revised version where there's no typo sorry um but uh the 13 goal areas and to say are these still the areas that we want to focus on remembering that it's not a direction that we want to go underneath them it's just those are the areas um kind of the priority areas and then really quickly if i can alicia we will absolutely be coming back to the council with a process for deciding what those action steps are. GOL is not going to be 
saying this is what we're doing, right? Like this will be a hundred percent built by council and we will have, I will, I'll bring forward a proposal for how to kind of decide on which ones go in the final um, version. Thank you. Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um, and that's a thank you to Anna and George, <laughs> Councilor Ryan. Um, Full GOL credit. But, but everyone, I, I, this is my first year not on GOL and it's the first year I haven't had to deal with this problem. And so I am <laughs> thrilled that there is progress because I know how hard it is. I know, um, yeah, and and it will continue to be hard, but but I wanna especially appreciate Anna and her bringing her professional experience into this conversation um, that many of us don't have that experience with and have been like floundering with how to move forward in many different iterations. Um, I, I already see two goal areas that can actually be objectives within other goal areas. So I'm hopeful we can get this down to at least 10, if not more lower, you know. Um, my One of my concerns is, well, it's not really a concern, but I guess it's more of a question and it goes along with Councillor Walker's sort of question, which is um, not could we only evaluate the manager on the action items that are specifically listed there, but how, if we don't list an action item, because it, you know, how do we limit them to a reasonable amount to give the manager leeway to do other things and not limit, you know, not sort of say, this is not him end up being, this is the only things you work on. How do we meet that that balance between us wanting to say, we think these are the areas you wanna work on, but we don't know what he goes through every day. Um, so we don't know what the manager has in his head that, and all of the department heads have in their head about what they need to work on to keep the ship running basically. And how do we balance that? And then how do we evaluate on that? Or how do we um, ensure that we also don't get a response, well, it's not in an action item, and so we're not going to put resources to it mid-year. What's our plan if that's a response we do get? Are we then modifying actionary, action items and, and stuff like that? Um, so that, that's just concerns and thoughts that I have immediately. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead, please. Um, yes, sorry. I, so I think this is a really good format, so I, I appreciate that. I think it's a much more workable format than we've had in the past. And um, I, what I want to ask is, did we have a special meeting at one point just to address town manager goals so it wasn't done? And will we be doing that? We had a retreat. Yeah, we did have, but we'll... And then we took the results of that retreat and... Then I asked you to rank them again. Right, right. And then we brought this back to the council and we had one discussion. And when we brought it up for other discussions, people said, nah, I don't want to talk about it. So we'll, to put our goals and action items into this format, will we do that at the beginning? When, will we have a special meeting to do that? I, it seems- we, That may certainly be something that GOL suggests. Seems like a lot to, dis, mm -hmm. to address in a council meeting. Right. Um, right. So I guess just picking up also on uh, what Mandy was, uh, Councilor Haneke said is there's all those items that the town manager and the staff does to keep the town running that you only are really aware of when they don't work and they, they do work. <laughs> so, yeah. And then we're really adding on special goals and action items. So there does have to be a way we can account for just everything the town staff does all day, every day, just to keep us afloat. So one of the things that I wanted to point out was in fact, we did spend a lot of time on the six priority areas. And so don't lose sight of the fact, this has been in your packet at least three times uh, in terms of what people have already said were top priority areas. Um, and uh, I do wanna thank Anna who actually looked at a couple different towns and our municipalities. And I believe this was one that came out of 
some someplace up on the north shore it's a combo of a couple uh yeah. concord was one of them yeah. i can if people want to see my my research i'm happy to share yeah i think i think I, no one wants to see they it. trust the fact that you will come on you. Uh, no, my guy we've had a request from the audience um okay uh anna what else do you need okay. to do does everyone understand their homework that I'm giving you. And you okay. have a deadline. You have a deadline. Yes, you do have a deadline. Uh, your deadline is October 31st. You have 10 days. Because I need to know it in order to create it for the packet for GOL. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Okay, yeah. So I think, Jennifer, to, to your point about like us discussing our priorities and the goals, it's, I, I to speak for myself only, I find it really confusing that they get conflated the way that they do. I sort of can understand the logic of it, but I don't like it. Um, but that's me and I'm going with what we've done. So when we consider that, that's that's when I want you all to pay really, want us all to pay really close attention, attention to the objectives column, because that really is the priority direction. Like they're the priority areas. And then the objectives are where are we going within that? Um, those should be things that and they will be things that are voted on by the council. Uh, I haven't figured out how we're going to do that yet. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if I can implement rank choice voting within the council. But uh, well, I'm, Athena's not going to look up past her. Like, she's like, no, Anna, stop. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, we're going to figure that out. But just so you know, that is the kind of the objectives column is really where that priority prioritization of um, where the council wants to go as well would be. And yes, not losing sight of all of the other pieces of their jobs was a big piece of this, because if this isn't just about the strategic direction, this is also the evaluation tool for the town manager, and he should get good marks for keeping the town afloat, right? So, and that is reflected in some of the management goal areas. And so the but I think clearly articulating that as the objective is, is really important as we continue. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right. Uh, we've done appointments. Um, so we're up to committee and liaison reports. CRC, Pam. Thank you. Uh, the CRC met on October 8 and reviewed section 1703 of the bylaw that we received from the solar bylaw working group. Um, and that was on definitions. And we also started to walk through all of the staff comments. So staff um, pulled together and provided comments to one, one member and those, those comments were consolidated. I do want to note that we have no meeting on November 5. Um, we were looking at that as a public hearing date. <clears throat> and Councillor Haneke made a very good point that there's going to be no public watching our public hearing. <laughs> so uh, um, it's going to be oh, on the show. I wonder why. <laughs> the public meeting, the public oh. hearing, excuse me, on University Drive will be held on November 12. And I think we've reported that previously. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> A little bit of humor there. Uh, elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. Uh, we didn't meet last Friday. We are meeting this Friday. And uh, I don't know what Paul has in his report, but we haven't finalized the bids on the school. So when it, there we, we've run into some bid issues. So we haven't actually had a discussion of that at the committee level. Okay. I think when we come to the town manager's report, we'll ask him to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be great. Excellent. Finance committee, Bob Hegner. Yes. Um, Lynn and I met with the town manager and the finance director on October 9th to lay out the work plan for the finance committee, um, assuming that we get uh, a whole bunch of new information uh, from the town manager on uh, November uh, 4th. So um, anyway, uh, the, the point is that we have a work plan 
uh, scheduled out for the first three weeks of November. And uh, it's going to be pretty intense. Um, so um, we haven't really met and we're not going to meet until until the, that time. So more to come. Councillor Haneke, you have a hand up. Um, could I request that if you've actually picked meeting dates, since I know there was a potential for changing of meetings and adding of meetings, could you actually send those dates and times to the committee members so that we can get them on our calendar? Because yeah. right now I still just have the two Tuesday meetings in November on my calendar, which I don't think are happening. Right. Well, I haven't, I haven't nailed down a couple of the members, so I will do that tomorrow. Make sure that... So. I, I think that's a plea to members to be responsive to whatever email Bob has sent out or Athena about meeting dates for finance committee. Okay. Um, Anna, GOL. So talked a lot already, but uh, the only other thing we have not talked about is that GOL is uh, working on the other carryover, one of the other carryover items that we have, which was the legislative process guide, um, and I included an update on that in the written report, uh, but we are currently working on making a making a document pulled from that guide that will serve as a reference document. It will not be something that is part of the rule as, as it currently stands. It will not be something that's written into the rules of the council proposed as a rule change for the council, uh, more as something people can use if they would like to. Thank you. Uh, Jones Library Committee, Pam. Yes, uh, Jones Library, <clears throat> excuse me, Jones Library meeting was the day after the CRC meeting. And it was a meeting not necessarily for the Jones Library Building Committee, but it was the it was the forum in which uh, the beginning of the section historic preservation, historic historic preservation section 106 uh, began and there were there were um, presentations five minute five minute presentations to the organizers of the committee or the review to um, express their concerns issues opportunities support whatever they each group wanted to bring to the table and uh, there was a bit of time for public comment, um, but it was pretty much limited to what the um, what the the parties who have signed up to be consulting parties, and it was sort of their opportunity to speak. Okay, so, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay, uh, TSO, Andy. Well, TSO, uh, looking forward because you had the report about what we've done recently, uh, and it reflects the the goals going forward too. I think that the there are now five items that we're working on. Uh, one that's a very high priority for us uh, is the intersection uh, suggestions for Southeast Street from Maine to College Streets. In other words, the area in front of the uh, new elementary school in the current Fort River School. <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, um, a, a goal and hopefully that by November, we will have a response to questions that have been raised by counselors and others. And uh, that will be uh, that compendium is going to go into the packet for Thursday's meeting that we have scheduled for TSO, and TSO will uh, then decide whether to adopt them as uh, or whether they want to make any changes. Um, and uh, the packet will probably be available tomorrow, and uh, so you, anybody who's interested can look. Uh, the other one that is a high priority for our work right now is the transportation and parking commission charge. And that's going to be the principal goal of our meeting on Thursday of this week. Uh, we're going to take um, as many of the issues as um, can be addressed 
and discussed um, that were in uh, Councillor Ryan's memo to the committee, which has been shared um, also. Um, so that's uh, what I think a principal goal is of the meeting. Um, the other two are the waste hauler program. And at this point, we're um, sort of in a holding zone uh, because we're waiting for the town manager to come back with us presumably sometime in November, um, but it will quickly come to the council uh, and probably um, needs the attention of the finance committee because it's a question of how to fund the consultant that we requested as a council. So that um, is uh, kind of just in a parking lot for a very short period of time. But we expect that sometime enough number to us. And of course, the schools are put on the agenda for Thursday's meeting. Uh, I put on the agenda for Thursday's meeting uh, the that topic on an if referred basis so that um, it, it, uh, we do have the opportunity to begin the discussion this Thursday. I, uh, uh, and I think that um, we have pretty good guidance out of today's discussion as to how to proceed with that and how to proceed with that uh, expeditiously and uh, not let us bog down. So we are um, aware we have four meetings scheduled for the remainder of the year, including two in November and two in December. And uh, we're trying to uh, place those uh, items within logical places within the agendas. And we will continue to report on our agendas going forward and on our uh, progress as we move forward. Thank you. Um, liaison reports. Seeing none, we have no minutes. Uh, town managers, there's no written reports, but Paul, there's a couple things you might want to comment on. Yes, yeah, so there are a few things. One, I sent the um, council my self evaluation for the performance uh, for for 2024, um, and so. It's very long. It, I think that really reflects the kind of the amount of work that our staff has been doing. The um, as as Bob said, this November is going to be a bit very heavy on finances. You're going to have a lot of appropriations, rescissions of borrowing items, um, presentations on financial indicators, capital projects. So think of November. Well, finance has had a bit of a breather in October finance and uh, the council will be very heavy on finances during the month of November and just to welcome your time thinking about those things. The um, election is going to be on Tuesday. We're prepared for that really well organized by the town clerk's office. Early voting has begun. Um, I was here at noon on Saturday and they had already had a hundred people vote in the first three hours of the morning, which is how many people voted all early voting last time they had early voting. <laughs> so there's a lot of interest. Obviously it's a presidential election, but um, there's no excuse for people not to be able to vote. There's, you can vote early, you can vote on the day and you mail in your ballot. And as Kathy said, with the school um, bid, um, we, I think we've talked about previously that we'd received three bids for the project. All were below the budgeted amount. A company called CTA Construction Managers of Waltham submitted the lowest bid at $73.48 million. The other two bidders ranged from the $73.48 million to $75.6 million. So it was in a relatively tight range. We The execution of the contract has been put on hold pending resolution of bid protest filed by two construction industry organizations and one of the other bidders. They assert that the CTA construction managers is not eligible to be awarded the contract for the project. So bid protests are common on large complex public projects and can often be resolved with the involvement of the attorney general's office. And that's where this bid uh, is right now. The, the attorney general's office will conduct a hearing next week to review the bid protest and issue an opinion as to whether CTA construction managers is eligible to be awarded the contract for the construction of the new school or not. 
We have not signed any, signed any contracts uh, with any of the vendors. So that's just where it is. There's another opportunity if the AG doesn't resolve it to anyone's satisfaction, they can also go into court and seek uh, remedy there. So, you know, we're unhappy that this is being delayed because we're on a relatively tight time frame where we need to get the school open in the fall of uh, and two years from now. And this is putting us, this is, we can't lose the time this early in the process. And we're trying to convey that to the attorney general as well to expedite the hearing and uh, the resolution of this. Thank you. Uh, Pam, you have your hand up. Um, can you tell us if the bid the bids will hold for to cover this entire period? Yes, we requested all the bidders to give us in another 30 days um, to hold their bids for an additional 30 days. Okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, I had heard that sub bids were in for the library project. Could you speak to that? Sure. So sub bids are the uh, when you go out to bid for a big project, you do you do sub bids, which is um, like the specialty con like the electrical contract, plumbing, um, HVAC, elevator, things like that. So the way it works is you bid out those specialties first, and then a general contractor comes in and they bid the general project. Those bids came the subcontractor work, which is a the bulk of the work came in about $2 million below where they were last time we went out to bid. So that's good news um, in terms of where, where the industry seems to be headed. We will see what happens with the general bids. Those, those bids are due, I think, October 31st. And then and we'd use a system called bid, bid docs. So it all it's all electronic. It comes in. It's instantly knowable. So we'll know what the numbers are. Again, these Bid awards can be complex and the contracting can be complex, um, but uh, hopefully uh, that gets done expeditiously as well. We want these projects to move forward. Are there any other questions of the town manager? Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, I submitted a president's report. It was sent to you on set on Sunday, I guess. And then I submitted an addendum and are there any questions? Uh, then let me just mention a couple quick things and, and also future agenda items. We have a visit of six students and three chaperones from Kanagasaki, our sister city. We will be meeting in this room at four o'clock. I'll be sending you a full schedule for when you might like to participate. I have mentioned already that we'll be meeting in this room at four o'clock on Thursday, October 31st, Halloween, um, at which point we will begin with kind of a ceremonial beginning, if you will, of the visit. The students and the chaperones will have arrived sometime right around lunch and have spent most of the afternoon on the Amherst, on the Amherst College campus. Uh, and then um, they will be spending most of Friday in the schools uh, yeah, Friday in the schools. They will stay with their host families. Uh, and then Saturday doing activities either together or again with their host families. And we'll conclude with a um, opportunity to partake of UMass dining uh, by going to one of the cafeterias and ending with a dinner that people will go get their dining and then be in a, a room uh, off of one of the dining halls on Saturday before they leave. Uh, and so both of our higher ed institutions have graciously stepped forward as uh, participating with us as hosts for these um, people that are coming. I'll be sending you more detail on that. With regard to uh, the next meeting, Paul has already mentioned uh, the financial nature of the month of November. Um, the, we will begin at six o'clock with the financial indicators, um, and that includes both the school committee and the um, Jones Library Board of Trustees, and then we'll move on to a variety of uh, appropriation and transfer recommendations. I also, count, along with the fact that you've received the town manager's self-evaluation uh, today, um, 
you also received from me a email which includes the evaluation form that you use as counselors. For some of you, this is the first time. And so if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me and I will be glad to by Zoom go over the format, et cetera. Um, I'm also glad to do it in a meeting. In addition to that, as of tomorrow morning, emails will go out to all committee members, commission members, board members. Um, the uh, public will be notified and um, there's a uh, various me electronic means and website notifications of that. And the staff will be, the, we reach out to the staff through the human resources director. Uh, all of those in inputs are due back to us no later than October 31st at midnight. And then we get, we provide that to you as fast as we can. And your evaluations are back due to me. And I have to just say, I've trimmed as much time off this as, as I can. I do not have time after Wednesday, November 13th at four o'clock to chase you down. I need you to really turn in your stuff on time because I have a huge writing project that I have to then do. Um, so that's that. Mandy Joe, did you have a question on this particular area? No, I wanted to I must okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to add an additional comment on that area. For those that have never done this before, mm -hmm. please go it ahead. It takes a ton of time, much more time than you may think it will take to complete that document. So I, I just wanted to give a heads up that you might plan for more time than you think you need and then plan for more on top of that. <laughs> well, and, and one of the reasons I sent it out today, along with the town manager's self-evaluation is even though you don't have feedback from staff, committees, or the public, you can get started. And starting means reading and starting in and so forth. Um, I Sharp and brief comments are welcome. Uh, longevity is fine, but then I have to weed through it. Uh, so that's that. Pam, did you have a comment on the evaluation? Yeah, um, I looked a couple of times in our packet for that information, I didn't see it. Um, so I'm not necessarily looking in my emails for that kind of thing. Can they also be placed in the packet? The, okay, the town manager evaluation, self, self evaluation was placed in the packet tonight and it tonight. was sent to you. It was right before the meeting and oh. it was sent to, I then forwarded it to all of you just about six o'clock or so tonight. It, it came in by email too, Pam. By okay. email. I haven't looked at my email. In addition to that, <laughs> I sent you an email earlier today, sometime I believe this morning, with the evaluation form. Don't worry, you'll be getting lots of reminders. Okay. Got it. And if, and I'll send another one tomorrow. Um, I, I several of you mentioned tonight that we have never had a real conversation about the AHRA priorities. And part of me is, I, I understand that, and I feel frustrated with that as well. Part of me doesn't know how to frame that conversation for this council. And one of the reasons why I think we've gone back to the idea that the um, um, to be formed committee would spend some time looking at the recommendations and the feasibility of is because that's part of the conversation that we need to have to have. And that is what is really feasible under the constrictions of the law, under the constrictions of how much money we have. And all of that is wrapped up in who is the target audience and the charge. So if anybody has a wonderful idea on how to engage the conversation with the council about the HRA priorities and report, I am more than open to having that conversation. It's not that I haven't tried to figure out how to do it. It's just, I haven't come up with a solution on how to do it, that it wouldn't be a several hour long meeting. Um, so with that, are there any other counselor comments or recommend or questions or priorities for the agenda, future agendas? Okay, then, um, I'm going to 
I'll make a motion to adjourn and seek a second. 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 Oh. Everybody's always eager to second. The motion's <laughs> been made and seconded. We'll move to a vote. Um, and the vote, we start with Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Yes. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye, and it's unanimous. The meeting is adjourned. It is 1018. <laughs>